Preface and Chapter 1 of Fifty Years in Chains, or The Life of an American Slave. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Cosby. Fifty Years in Chains, or The Life of an American Slave, by Charles Ball. Preface and Chapter 1, Separated from My Mother. Preface the story which follows is true in every particular. Responsible citizens of a neighboring state can vouch for the reality of the narrative. The language of the slave has not at all times been strictly adhered to, as a half-century of bondage unfitted him for literary work. The subject of the story is still a slave by the laws of this country, and it would not be wise to reveal his name. Chapter 1. Separated from My Mother My story is a true one, and I shall tell it in a simple style. It will be merely a recital of my life as a slave in the southern states of the Union, a description of Negro slavery in the model republic. My grandfather was brought from Africa and sold as a slave in Calvert County in Maryland. I never understood the name of the ship in which he was imported, nor the name of the planter who bought him on his arrival. But at the time I knew him, he was a slave in a family called Maud, who resided near Leonardtown. My father was a slave in a family named Haughty, living near the same place. My mother was the slave of a tobacco planter, who died when I was about four years old. My mother had several children, and they were sold upon master's death to separate purchasers. She was sold, my father told me, to a Georgia trader. I, of all her children, was the only one left in Maryland. When sold, I was naked, never having had on clothes in my life. But my new master gave me a child's frock belonging to one of his own children. After he had purchased me, he dressed me in this garment, took me before him on his horse, and started home. But my poor mother, when she saw me leaving her for the last time, ran after me, took me down from the horse, clasped me in her arms, and wept loudly and bitterly over me. My master seemed to pity her, and endeavored to soothe her distress by telling her that he would be a good master to me, and that I should not want anything. She then, still holding me in her arms, walked along the road beside the horse as he moved slowly and earnestly and imploringly besought my master to buy her and the rest of her children and not permit them to be carried away by the Negro buyers. But whilst thus entreating him to save her and her family, the slave driver who had first bought her came running in pursuit of her with a rawhide in his hand. When he overtook us, he told her he was her master now and ordered her to give that little negro to its owner and come back with him. My mother then turned to him and cried, Oh, master, do not take me from my child. Without making any reply, he gave her two or three heavy blows on the shoulders with his rawhide, snatched me from her arms handed me to my master, and seizing her by one arm, dragged her back towards the place of sale. My master then quickened the pace of his horse, and as we advanced, the cries of my poor parent became more and more indistinct. At length they died away in the distance, and I never again heard the voice of my poor mother. Young as I was, the horrors of that day sank deeply into my heart, and even at this time, though half a century has elapsed, the terrors of the scene return with painful vividness upon my memory, frightened at the sight of the cruelties inflicted upon my poor mother. I forgot my own sorrows at parting from her, and clung to my new master as an angel and a savior when compared with the hardened fiend into whose power she had fallen. 
She had been a kind and good mother to me, had warmed me in her bosom in the cold nights of winter, and had often divided the scanty pittance of food allowed her by her mistress between my brothers and sisters and me, and gone supperless to bed herself. Whatever victuals she could obtain beyond the coarse food, salt fish and cornbread, allowed to slaves on the Patuxet and Potomac rivers, she carefully distributed among her children, and treated us with all the tenderness which her own miserable condition would permit. I have no doubt that she was chained and driven to Carolina, and toiled out the residue of a forlorn and famished existence in the rice swamps or indigo fields of the South. My father never recovered from the effects of the shock which the sudden and overwhelming ruin of his family gave him. He had formerly been of a gay, social temper, and when he came to see us on a Saturday night, he always brought us some little present, such as the means of a poor slave would allow, apples, melons, sweet potatoes, or, if he could procure nothing else, a little parched corn, which tasted better in our cabin because he had brought it. He spent the greater part of the time which his master permitted him to pass with us in relating such stories as he had learned from his companions, or in singing the rude songs common amongst the slaves of Maryland and Virginia. After this time, I never heard him laugh heartily or sing a song. He became gloomy and morose in his temper, to all but me and spent nearly all his leisure time with my grandfather, who claimed kindred with some royal family in Africa, and had been a great warrior in his native country. The master of my father was a hard, penurious man, and so exceedingly avaricious that he scarcely allowed himself the common conveniences of life. A stranger to sensibility, he was incapable of tracing the change in the temper and deportment of my father to its true cause, but attributed it to a sullen discontent with his condition as a slave, and a desire to abandon his service and seek his liberty by escaping to some of the free states. To prevent the perpetuation of this suspected crime of running away from slavery, the old man resolved to sell my father to a southern slave dealer, and accordingly applied to one of those men who was at that time in Calvert to become the purchaser. The price was agreed on, but as my father was a very strong, active, and resolute man, it was deemed unsafe for the Georgian to attempt to seize him, even with the aid of others in the daytime when he was at work. As it was known, he carried upon his person a large knife. It was therefore determined to secure him by stratagem. And for this purpose, a farmer in the neighborhood, who was made privy to the plan, alleged that he had lost a pig, which must have been stolen by someone, and that he suspected my father to be the thief. A constable was employed to arrest him. But as he was afraid to undertake the business alone, he called on his way at the house of the master of my grandfather to procure assistance from the overseer of the plantation. When he arrived at the house, the overseer was at the barn, and thither he repaired to make his application. At the end of the barn was the coach house, and as the day was cool, to avoid the wind which was high, the two walked to the side of the coach house to talk over the matter and settle their plan of operations. It so happened that my grandfather, whose business it was to keep the coach in good condition, was at work at this time, rubbing the plated handles of the doors and brightening the other metallic parts of the vehicle. Hearing the voice of the overseer without, he suspended his work and listening attentively, became a party to their counsels. They agreed that they would delay the execution of their project until the next day, as it was then late. They supposed they would have no difficulty in apprehending their intended victim, as 
knowing himself innocent of the theft, he would readily consent to go with the constable to a justice of the peace, to have the charge examined. That night, however, about midnight, my grandfather silently repaired to the cabin of my father, a distance of about three miles, aroused him from his sleep, made him acquainted with the extent of his danger, gave him a bottle of cider and a small bag of parched corn, and then enjoined him to fly from the destination which awaited him. In the morning, the Georgian could not find his newly purchased slave, who was never seen or heard of in Maryland from that day. After the flight of my father, my grandfather was the only person left in Maryland with whom I could claim kindred. He was an old man, nearly eighty years old, he said, and he manifested all the fondness for me that I could expect from one so old. He was feeble, and his master required but little work from him. He always expressed contempt for his fellow slaves, for when young, he was an African of rank in his native land. He had a small cabin of his own, with half an acre of ground attached to it, which he cultivated on his own account, and from which he drew a large share of his sustenance. He had singular religious notions, never going to meeting or caring for the preachers he could, if he would, occasionally hear. He retained his native traditions respecting the deity and hereafter. It is not strange that he believed the religion of his oppressors to be the invention of designing men, for the text oftenest quoted in his hearing was, Servants, be obedient to your masters. The name of the man who purchased me at the Vendu and became my master was John Cox, but he was generally called Jack Cox. He was a man of kindly feelings towards his family, and treated his slaves, of whom he had several besides me, with humanity. He permitted my grandfather to visit me as often as he pleased, and allowed him sometimes to carry me to his own cabin, which stood in a lonely place at the head of a deep hollow, almost surrounded by a thicket of cedar trees which had grown up in a worn-out and abandoned tobacco field. My master gave me better clothes than the little slaves of my age generally received in Calvert, and often told me that he intended to make me his waiter, and that if I behaved well, I should become his overseer in time. These stations of waiter and overseer appeared to me to be the highest points of honor and greatness in the whole world and had not circumstances frustrated my master's plans, as well as my own views, I should probably have been living at this time in a cabin on the corner of some tobacco plantation. Fortune had decreed otherwise. When I was about twelve years old, my master, Jack Cox, died of a disease which had long confined him to the house. I was sorry for the death of my master, who had always been kind to me, and I soon discovered that I had good cause to regret his departure from this world. He had several children at the time of his death, who were all young, the oldest being about my own age. The father of my late master, who was still living, became administrator of his estate, and took possession of his property, and amongst the rest, of myself. This old gentleman treated me with the greatest severity, and compelled me to work very hard on his plantation for several years, until I suppose I must have been near or quite twenty years of age. As I was always very obedient and ready to execute all his orders, I did not receive much whipping, but suffered greatly for want of sufficient and proper food. My master allowed his slaves a peck of corn each per week throughout the year, and this we had to grind into meal in a hand mill for ourselves. We had a tolerable supply of meat for a short time, about the month of December when he killed his hogs. After that season, we had meat once a week, unless bacon became scarce, which very often happened 
in which case we had no meat at all. However, as we fortunately lived near both the Patuxent River and the Chesapeake Bay, we had abundance of fish in the spring, and as long as the fishing season continued, after that period, each slave received, in addition to his allowance of corn, one salt herring every day. My master gave me one pair of shoes, one pair of stockings, one hat, one jacket of coarse cloth, two coarse shirts, and two pair of trousers yearly. He allowed me no other clothes. In the winter time, I often suffered very much from the cold. As I had to drive the team of oxen, which hauled the tobacco to market, and frequently did not get home until late at night, the distance being considerable, and my cattle traveled very slow. One Saturday evening, when I came home from the cornfield, my master told me that he had hired me out for a year at the city of Washington, and that I would have to live at the Navy Yard. On the New Year's Day following, which happened about two weeks afterwards, my master set forward for Washington on horseback and ordered me to accompany him on foot. It was night when we arrived at the Navy Yard, and everything appeared very strange to me. I was told by a gentleman who had epaulets on his shoulders that I must go on board a large ship which lay in the river. He, at the same time, told the boy to show me the way. This ship proved to be a frigate, and I was told that I had been brought there to cook for the people belonging to her. In the course of a few days, the duties of my station became quite familiar to me, and in the enjoyment of a profusion of excellent provisions, I felt very happy. I strove by all means to please the officers and gentlemen who came on board, and in this I soon found my account. One gave me a half-worn coat, another an old shirt, and a third a cast-off waistcoat and pantaloons. Some presented me with small sums of money, and in this way I soon found myself well clothed and with more than a dollar in my pocket. My duties, though constant, were not burthensome, and I was permitted to spend Sunday afternoon in my own way. I generally went up into the city to see the new and splendid buildings, often walked as far as Georgetown, and made many new acquaintances among the slaves and frequently saw large numbers of people of my color chained together in long trains and driven off towards the south. At that time, the slave trade was not regarded with so much indignation and disgust as it is now. It was a rare thing to hear of a person of color running away and escaping altogether from his master, my father being the only one within my knowledge who had before this time obtained his liberty in this manner in Calvert County. And, as before stated, I never heard what became of him after his flight. I remained on board the frigate and about the navy yard two years and was quite satisfied with my lot, until about three months before the expiration of this period, when it so happened that a schooner, loaded with iron and other materials for the use of the yard, arrived from Philadelphia. She came and lay close by the frigate to discharge her cargo, and amongst her crew I observed a black man, with whom, in the course of a day or two, I became acquainted. He told me he was free, and lived in Philadelphia, where he kept a house of entertainment for sailors, which, he said, was attended to in his absence by his wife. His description of Philadelphia and of the liberty enjoyed there by the black people, so charmed my imagination that I determined to devise some plan of escaping from the frigate and making my way to the north. I communicated my designs to my new friend, who promised to give me his aid. We agreed that the night before the schooner should sail, I was to be concealed in the hold amongst a parcel of loose tobacco, which, he said, the captain had undertaken to carry to Philadelphia. The sailing of the schooner was delayed longer than we expected, and finally her captain 
purchased a cargo of flour in Georgetown and sailed for the West Indies. Whilst I was anxiously awaiting some other opportunity of making my way to Philadelphia, the idea of crossing the country to the western part of Pennsylvania never entered my mind. New Year's Day came, and with it came my old master from Calvert, accompanied by a gentleman named Gibson, to whom he said he had sold me, and to whom he delivered me over in the Navy Yard. We all three set out that same evening for Calvert, and reached the residence of my new master the next day. Here I was informed that I had become the subject of a lawsuit. My new master claimed me under his purchase from old Mr. Cox, and another gentleman of the neighborhood named Levin Ballard had bought me of the children of my former master, Jack Cox. This suit continued in the courts of Calvert County more than two years, but was finally decided in favor of him who had bought me of the children. I went home with my master, Mr. Gibson, who was a farmer and with whom I lived three years. Soon after I came to live with Mr. Gibson, I married a girl of color named Judah, the slave of a gentleman by the name of Sims, who resided in the same neighborhood. I was at the house of Mr. Sims every week and became as well acquainted with him and his family as I was with my master. Mr. Sims also married a wife about the time I did. The lady whom he married lived near Philadelphia, and when she first came to Maryland, she refused to be served by a black chambermaid, but employed a white girl, the daughter of a poor man who lived near. The lady was reported to be very wealthy, and brought a large trunk full of plate and other valuable articles. This trunk was so heavy that I could scarcely carry it, and it impressed my mind with the idea of great riches in the owner at that time. After some time, Mrs. Sims dismissed her white chambermaid and placed my wife in that situation, which I regarded as a fortunate circumstance, as it ensured her good food and at least one good suit of clothes. The Sims family was one of the most ancient in Maryland, and had been a long-time resident in Calvert County. The grounds had been laid out, and all the improvements projected about the family abode in a style of much magnificence according to the custom of the old aristocracy of Maryland and Virginia. A pendant to the domicile, and at no great distance from the house, was a family vault built of brick in which reposed the occupants of the estate, who had lived there for many previous generations. This vault had not been opened or entered for fifteen years previous to the time of which I speak, but it so happened that at this period a young man, a distant relation of the family, died, having requested on his deathbed that he might be buried in this family resting place. When I came on Saturday evening to see my wife and child, Mr. Sims desired me, as I was older than any of his black men, to take an iron pick and go and open the vault, which I accordingly did by cutting away the mortar and removing a few bricks from one side of the building. But I could not remove more than three or four bricks before I was obliged by the horrid effluvia which issued at the aperture to retire. It was the most deadly and sickening scent that I had ever smelled, and I could not return to complete the work until after the sun had risen the next day, when I pulled down so much of one of the side walls as to permit persons to walk in upright. I then went in alone and examined this house of the dead, and surely no picture could more strongly and vividly depict the emptiness of all earthly vanity, and the nothingness of human pride. Dispersed over the floor lay the fragments of more than twenty human skeletons, each in the place where it had been deposited by the idle tenderness of surviving friends. In some cases, nothing remained but the hair and the larger bones, 
whilst in several the form of the coffin was yet visible, with all the bones resting in their proper places. One coffin, the sides of which were yet standing, the lid only having decayed and partly fallen in, so as to disclose the contents of this narrow cell, presented a peculiarly moving spectacle. Upon the center of the lid was a large silver plate, and the head and foot were adorned with silver stars. The nails which had united the parts of the coffin had also silver heads. Within lay the skeletons of a mother and her infant child, in slumbers only to be broken by the peal of the last trumpet. The bones of the infant lay upon the breast of the mother, where the hands of affection had shrouded them. The ribs of the parent have fallen down and rested on the backbone. Many gold rings were about the bones of the fingers. Brilliant earrings lay beneath where the ears had been, and a glittering gold chain encircled the ghastly and haggard vertebrae of a once beautiful neck. The shroud and flesh had disappeared, but the hair of the mother appeared strong and fresh. Even the silken locks of the infant were still preserved. Behold, the end of youth and beauty, and of all that is lovely in life. The coffin was so much decayed that it could not be removed. A thick and dismal vapor hung embodied from the roof and walls of this charnel house, in appearance somewhat like a mass of dark cobwebs, but which was impalpable to the touch and when stirred by the hand, vanished away. On the second day, we deposited with his kindred the corpse of the young man, and at night I again carefully closed up the breach which I had made in the walls of this dwelling place of the dead. End of chapter 1 Recording by Tom Cosby Chapter 2 of Fifty Years in Chains, or The Life of an American Slave. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Cosby. Fifty Years in Chains, or The Life of an American Slave, by Charles Ball. Chapter 2. Some short time after my wife became chambermaid to her mistress, it was my misfortune to change masters once more. Levin Ballard, who, as before stated, had purchased me of the children of my former master, Jack Cox, was successful in his lawsuit with Mr. Gibson, the object of which was to determine the right of property in me. And one day, Whilst I was at work in the cornfield, Mr. Ballard came and told me I was his property, asking me at the same time if I was willing to go with him. I told him I was not willing to go, but that if I belonged to him, I knew I must. We then went to the house, and Mr. Gibson, not being at home, Mrs. Gibson told me I must go with Mr. Ballard. I accordingly went with him determining to serve him obediently and faithfully. I remained in his service almost three years, and as he lived near the residence of my wife's master, my former mode of life was not materially changed by this change of home. Mrs. Sims spent much of her time in exchanging visits with the families of other large planters, both in Calvert and the neighboring counties. And through my wife, I became acquainted with the private family history of many of the principal persons in Maryland. There was a great proprietor who resided in another county, who owned several hundred slaves, and who permitted them to beg of travelers on the highway. This same gentleman had several daughters, and according to the custom of the time, kept what they called open house. That is, his house was free to all persons of genteel appearance, who
who chose to visit it. The young ladies were supposed to be the greatest fortunes in the country, were reputed beautiful, and consequently were greatly admired. Two gentlemen, who were lovers of these girls, desirous of amusing their mistresses, invited a young man whose standing in society they supposed to be beneath theirs, to go with them to the manor, as it was called. When there, they endeavored to make him an object of ridicule in presence of the ladies, but he so well acquitted himself and manifested such superior wit and talents that one of the young ladies fell in love with him and soon after wrote him a letter, which led to their marriage. His two pretended friends were never afterwards countenanced by the family as gentlemen of honor, but the fortunate husband avenged himself of his heartless companions by inviting them to his wedding and exposing them to the observation of the vast assemblage of fashionable people who always attended a marriage in the family of a great planter. The two gentlemen, who had been thus made to fall into the pit that they had dug for another, were so much chagrined at the issue of the adventure that one soon left Maryland and the other became a common drunkard and died a few years afterwards. My change of masters realized all the evil apprehensions which I had entertained. I found Mr. Ballard sullen and crabbed in his temper and always prone to find fault with my conduct, no matter how hard I had labored or how careful I was to fulfill all his orders and obey his most unreasonable commands. Yet it so happened that he never beat me, for which I was altogether indebted to the good character for industry, sobriety, and humility, which I had established in the neighborhood. I think he was ashamed to abuse me, lest he should suffer in the good opinion of the public, for he often fell into the most violent fits of anger against me, and overwhelmed me with coarse and abusive language. He did not give me clothes enough to keep me warm in the winter, and compelled me to work in the woods when there was deep snow on the ground, by which I suffered very much. I had determined at last to speak to him to sell me to some person in the neighborhood so that I might still be near my wife and children. But a different fate awaited me. My master kept a store at a small village on the bank of the Patuxent River, called B, although he resided at some distance on a farm. One morning he rose early and ordered me to take a yoke of oxen and go to the village, to bring home a cart which was there, saying he would follow me. He arrived at the village soon after I did, and took his breakfast with his storekeeper. He then told me to come into the house and get my breakfast. Whilst I was eating in the kitchen, I observed him talking earnestly, but low, to a stranger near the kitchen door. I soon after went out and hitched my oxen to the cart and was about to drive off when several men came round about me and amongst them the stranger whom I had seen speaking with my master. This man came up to me and, seizing me by the collar, shook me violently, saying I was his property and must go with him to Georgia. At the sound of these words, the thoughts of my wife and children rushed across my mind, and my heart beat away within me. I saw and knew that my case was hopeless, and that resistance was vain, as there were near twenty persons present, all of whom were ready to assist the man by whom I was kidnapped. I felt incapable of weeping or speaking, and in my despair I laughed loudly. My purchaser ordered me to cross my hands behind, which were quickly bound with a strong cord, and then he told me that we must set out that very day for the south. 
I asked if I could not be allowed to go to see my wife and children, or if this could not be permitted, if they might not have leave to come to see me, but was told that I would be able to get another wife in Georgia. My new master, whose name I did not hear, took me that same day across the Patuxent, where I joined 51 other slaves whom he had bought in Maryland. Thirty-two of these were men, and nineteen were women. The women were merely tied together with a rope about the size of a bed cord, which was tied like a halter round the neck of each. But the men, of whom I was the stoutest and strongest, were very differently caparisoned. A strong iron collar was closely fitted by means of a padlock round each of our necks. A chain of iron, about a hundred feet in length, was passed through the hasp of each padlock, except at the two ends, where the hasps of the padlock passed through a link of the chain. In addition to this, we were handcuffed in pairs, with iron staples and bolts, with a short chain about a foot long, uniting the handcuffs and their wearers in pairs. In this manner, we were chained alternately by the right and left hand, and the poor man to whom I was thus ironed wept like an infant when the blacksmith, with his heavy hammer, fastened the ends of the bolts that kept the staples from slipping from our arms. For my own part, I felt indifferent to my fate. It appeared to me that the worst had come that could come, and that no change of fortune could harm me. After we were all chained and handcuffed together, we sat down upon the ground, and here, reflecting upon the sad reverse of fortune that had so suddenly overtaken me, I became weary of life, and bitterly execrated the day I was born. It seemed that I was destined by fate to drink the cup of sorrow to the very dregs, and that I should find no respite from misery but in the grave. I longed to die and escape from the hands of my tormentors, but even the wretched privilege of destroying myself was denied me, for I could not shake off my chains nor move a yard without the consent of my master. Reflecting in silence upon my forlorn condition, I at length concluded that as things could not become worse, and as the life of man is but a continued round of changes, they must, of necessity, take a turn in my favor at some future day. I found relief in this vague and indefinite hope, and when we received orders to go on board the scow, which was to transport us over the Patuxent, I marched down to the water with a firmness of purpose of which I did not believe myself capable a few minutes before. We were soon on the south side of the river, and taking up our line of march, we traveled about five miles that evening and stopped for the night at one of those miserable public houses so frequent in the lower parts of Maryland and Virginia called ordinaries. Our master ordered a pot of mush to be made for our supper, after dispatching which we all lay down on the naked floor to sleep in our handcuffs and chains. The women, my fellow slaves, lay on one side of the room, and the men who were chained with me occupied the other. I slept but little this night, which I passed in thinking of my wife and little children, whom I could not hope ever to see again. I also thought of my grandfather and of the long nights I had passed with him, listening to his narratives of the scenes through which he had passed in Africa. I at length fell asleep, but was distressed by painful dreams. 
my wife and children appeared to be weeping and lamenting my calamity and beseeching and imploring my master on their knees not to carry me away from them. My little boy came and begged me not to go and leave him and endeavored, as I thought, with his little hands to break the fetters that bound me. I awoke in agony and cursed my existence. I could not pray, for the measure of my woes seemed to be full, and I felt as if there was no mercy in heaven nor compassion on earth for a man who was born a slave. Day at length came, and with the dawn we resumed our journey towards the Potomac. As we passed along the road, I saw the slaves at work in the corn and tobacco fields. I knew they toiled hard and lacked food, but they were not, like me, dragged in chains from their wives, children, and friends. Compared with me, they were the happiest of mortals. I almost envied them their blessed lot. Before night, we crossed the Potomac at Hose Ferry and bade farewell to Maryland. At night, we stopped at the house of a poor gentleman. At least he appeared to wish my master to consider him a gentleman, and he had no difficulty in establishing his claim to poverty. He lived at the side of the road in a framed house, which had never been plastered within, the weatherboards being the only wall. He had about fifty acres of land enclosed by a fence, the remains of a farm which had once covered two or three hundred acres. But the cedar bushes had encroached upon all sides until the cultivation had been confined to its present limits. The land was the picture of sterility, and there was neither barn nor stable on the place. The owner was ragged, and his wife and children were in a similar plight. It was with difficulty that we obtained a bushel of corn, which our master ordered us to parch at a fire made in the yard, and to eat for our supper. Even this miserable family possessed two slaves, half-starved, half-naked wretches, whose appearance bespoke them familiar with hunger and victims of the lash. But yet there was one pang which they had not known. They had not been chained and driven from their parents or children into hopeless exile. We left this place early in the morning and directed our course toward the southwest, our master riding beside us and hastening our march, sometimes by words of encouragement and sometimes by threats of punishment. The women took their place in the rear of our line. We halted about nine o'clock for breakfast and received as much cornbread as we could eat, together with a plate of boiled herrings and about three pounds of pork amongst us. Before we left this place, I was removed from near the middle of the chain and placed at the front end of it, so that I now became the leader of the file and held this post of honor until our irons were taken from us near the town of Columbia in South Carolina. We continued our route this day along the high road between the Potomac and Rappahannock, and I saw each of those rivers several times before night. Our master gave us no dinner today, but we halted and got as much corn mush and sour milk as we could eat for supper. The weather grew mild and pleasant, and we needed no more fires at night. From this time we all slept promiscuously, men and women on the floors of such houses as we chanced to stop at. We passed on through Bowling Green, a quiet village. Time did not reconcile me to my chains, but it made me familiar with them. I reflected on my desperate situation with a degree of calmness hoping that I might be able to devise some means of escape. 
my master, placed a particular value upon me. For I heard him tell a tavern keeper that if he had me in Georgia, he could get $800 for me. But he had bought me for his brother and believed he should not sell me. He afterwards changed his mind, however. I carefully examined every part of our chain, but found no place where it could be separated. We all had as much cornbread as we could eat, procured of our owner at the places we stopped at for the night. In addition to this, we usually had a salt herring every day. On Sunday, we had a quarter of a pound of bacon each. We continued our course up the country westward for a few days and then turned south, crossed James River above Richmond, as I heard at the time. After more than four weeks of travel, we entered South Carolina near Camden, and for the first time I saw a field of cotton in bloom. As we approached the Yatkin River, the tobacco disappeared from the fields, and the cotton plant took its place as an article of general culture. I was now a slave in South Carolina and had no hope of ever again seeing my wife and children. I had at times serious thoughts of suicide, so great was my anguish. If I could have got a rope, I should have hanged myself at Lancaster. The thought of my wife and children I had been torn from in Maryland and the dreadful, undefined future which was before me came near driving me mad. It was long after midnight before I fell asleep, but the most pleasant dream succeeded to these sorrowful forebodings. I thought I had escaped my master, and through great difficulties made my way back to Maryland, and was again in my wife's cabin with my little children on my lap. Every object was so vividly impressed on my mind in this dream that when I awoke, a firm conviction settled upon my mind that by some means, at present incomprehensible to me, I should yet again embrace my wife and caress my children in their humble dwelling. Early in the morning, our master called us up and distributed to each of the party a cake made of cornmeal and a small piece of bacon. On our journey, we had only eaten twice a day and had not received breakfast until about nine o'clock. But he said this morning meal was given to welcome us to South Carolina. He then addressed us all and told us we might now give up all hope of ever returning to the places of our nativity as it would be impossible for us to pass through the states of North Carolina and Virginia without being taken up and sent back. He further advised us to make ourselves contented, as he would take us to Georgia, a far better country than any we had seen, and where we would be able to live in the greatest abundance. About sunrise, we took up our march on the road to Columbia, as we were told. Hitherto, our master had not offered to sell any of us, and had even refused to stop to talk to any one on the subject of our sale, although he had several times been addressed on this point before we reached Lancaster. But soon after we departed from this village, we were overtaken on the road by a man on horseback, who accosted our driver by asking him if his niggers were for sale. The latter replied that he believed he would not sell any yet, as he was on his way to Georgia, and cotton being now much in demand, he expected to obtain high prices for us from persons who were going to settle in the new purchase. He, however, contrary to his custom, ordered us to stop and told the stranger he might look at us, and that he would find us as fine a lot of hands as were ever imported into the country, that we were all prime property, and he had no doubt would command his own prices in Georgia. The stranger, who was a thin, weather-beaten, sunburned figure, then said he wanted a couple of breeding wenches, and would give as much for them as they would bring in Georgia, that he had lately heard from Augusta, and that niggers were not higher there than in Columbia, 
and, as he had been in Columbia the week before, he knew what niggers were worth. He then walked along our line as we stood chained together and looked at the whole of us. Then, turning to the women, asked the prices of the two pregnant ones. Our master replied that these were two of the best breeding wenches in all Maryland, that one was twenty-two and the other only nineteen, that the first was already the mother of seven children and the other of four, that he had himself seen the children at the time he bought their mothers, and that such wenches would be cheap at a thousand dollars each. But as they were not able to keep up with the gang, he would take twelve hundred dollars for the two. The purchaser said this was too much, but that he would give nine hundred dollars for the pair. This price was promptly refused, but our master, after some consideration, said he was willing to sell a bargain in these winches and would take eleven hundred dollars for them, which was objected to on the other side and many faults and failings were pointed out in the merchandise. After much bargaining and many gross jests on the part of the stranger, he offered a thousand dollars for the two and said he would give no more. He then mounted his horse and moved off. But after he had gone about one hundred yards, he was called back, and our master said, if he would go with him to the next blacksmith's shop on the road to Columbia and pay for taking the irons off the rest of us, he might have the two women. This proposal was agreed to, and as it was now about nine o'clock, we were ordered to hasten on to the next house, where, we were told, we must stop for breakfast. At this place, we were informed that it was ten miles to the next smith's shop and our new acquaintance was obliged by the terms of his contract to accompany us thither. We received for breakfast about a pint of boiled rice to each person, and after this was dispatched, we again took to the road, eager to reach the blacksmith's shop, at which we expected to be relieved of the iron rings and chains, which had so long galled and worried us. About two o'clock, we arrived at the longed-for residence of the smith, but on inquiry, our master was informed that he was not at home and would not return before evening. Here a controversy arose, whether we should all remain here until the smith returned, or the stranger should go on with us to the next smithery, which was said to be only five miles distance. This was a point not easily settled between two such spirits as our master and the stranger, both of whom had been overseers in their time, and both of whom had risen to the rank of proprietors of slaves. The matter had already produced angry words and much vaunting on the part of the stranger, that a freeman of South Carolina was not to be imposed upon, that by the constitution of the state, his rights were sacred, and he was not to be deprived of his liberty at the arbitrary will of a man just from amongst the Yankees, and who had brought with him to the South as many Yankee tricks as he had niggers, and he believed many more. He then swore that all the niggers in the drove were Yankee niggers. When I overseed for Colonel Polk, said he, on his rice plantation, he had two Yankee niggers that he brought from Maryland, and they were running away every day. I gave them a hundred lashes more than a dozen times, but they never quit running away, till I chained them together with iron collars round their necks, and chained them to spades, and made them do nothing but dig ditches to drain the rice swamps. They could not run away then unless they went together and carried their chains and spades with them. I kept them in this way two years, and better niggers I never had. One of them died one night, and the other was never good for anything after he lost his mate. He never ran away afterwards, but he died too after a while.
He then addressed himself to the two women, whose master he had become, and told them that if ever they ran away, he would treat them in the same way. Wretched as I was myself, my heart bled for these poor creatures who had fallen into the hands of a tiger in human form. The dispute between the two masters was still raging when, unexpectedly, the blacksmith rode up to his house on a thin, bony-looking horse and, dismounting, asked his wife what these gentlemen were making such a frolic about. I did not hear her answer, but both the disputants turned and addressed themselves to the smith, the one to know what price he would demand to take the irons off all these niggers, and the other to know how long it would take him to perform the work. It is here proper for me to observe that there are many phrases of language in common use in Carolina and Georgia which are applied in a way that would not be understood by persons from one of the northern states. For instance, when several persons are quarreling, brawling, making a great noise, or even fighting, they say, the gentlemen are frolicking. I heard many other terms equally strange whilst I resided in the southern country amongst such white people as I became acquainted with, though my acquaintance was confined, in great measure, to overseers and such people as did not associate with the rich planters and great families. The smith, at length, agreed to take the irons from the whole of us for two dollars and fifty cents, and immediately set about it, with the air of indifference, that he would have manifested in tearing a pair of old shoes from the hoofs of a wagon horse. It was four weeks and five days from the time my irons had been riveted upon me until they were removed, and great as had been my sufferings whilst chained to my fellow slaves, I cannot say that I felt any pleasure in being released from my long confinement for I knew that my liberation was only preparatory to my final and, as I feared, perpetual subjugation to the power of some such monster as the one then before me who was preparing to drive away the two unfortunate women whom he had purchased and whose life's blood he had acquired the power of shedding at pleasure for the sum of a thousand dollars. After we were released from our chains, our master sold the whole lot of irons, which we had borne from Maryland, to the blacksmith for seven dollars. The smith then procured a bottle of rum and treated his two new acquaintances to a part of its contents, wishing them both good luck with their niggers. After these civilities were over, the two women were ordered to follow their new master, who shaped his course across the country by a road leading west-west. At parting from us, they both wept aloud and wrung their hands in despair. We all went to them and bade them a last farewell. Their road led into a wood, which they soon entered, and I never saw them nor heard of them again. These women have both been driven from Calvert County, as well as myself, and the fate of the younger of the two was peculiarly severe. She had been brought up as a waiting maid of a young lady, the daughter of a gentleman, whose wife and family often visited the mistress of my own wife. I had frequently seen this woman when she was a young girl in attendance upon her young mistress and riding in the same carriage with her. The father of the young lady died, and soon after she married a gentleman who resided a few miles off. The husband received a considerable fortune with his bride, and amongst other things her waiting maid, who was reputed a great beauty among people of color. He had been addicted to the fashionable sports of the country before marriage, such as horse racing, fox hunting, etc., and I had heard the black people say he drank too freely, but it was supposed 
that he would correct all these irregularities after marriage, more especially as his wife was a great belle and withal very handsome. The reverse, however, turned out to be the fact. Instead of growing better, he became worse, and in the course of a few years was known all over the country as a drunkard and a gambler. His wife, it was said, died of grief, and soon after her death, his effects were seized by his creditors and sold by the sheriff. The former waiting maid, now the mother of several children, was purchased by our present master for four hundred dollars at the sheriff's sale, and this poor wretch, whose employment in early life had been to take care of her young mistress and attend to her in her chamber and at her toilet, after being torn from her husband and her children, had now gone to toil out a horrible existence beneath the scorching sun of a South Carolina cotton field, under the dominion of a master as void of manners of a gentleman as he was of the language of humanity. It was now late in the afternoon, but, as we had made little progress today, and were now divested of the burden of our chains, as well as freed from the two women, who had hitherto much retarded our march, our master ordered us to hasten on our way, as we had ten miles to go that evening. I had been so long oppressed by the weight of my chains and the iron collar about my neck, that for some time after I commenced walking at my natural liberty, I felt a kind of giddiness or lightness of the head. Most of my companions complained of the same sensation, and we did not recover our proper feelings until after we had slept one night. It was after dark when we arrived at our lodging place, which proved to be the house of a small cotton planter, who, it appeared, kept a sort of house of entertainment for travelers, contrary to what I afterwards discovered to be the usual custom of cotton planters. This man and my master had known each other before, and seemed to be well acquainted. He was the first person that we had met since leaving Maryland, who was known to my master, and as they kept up a very free conversation through the course of the evening, and the house in which they were was only separated from the kitchen in which we were lodged by a space of a few feet, I had an opportunity of hearing much that was highly interesting to me. The landlord, after supper, came with our master to look at us and to see us receive our allowance of boiled rice from the hands of a couple of black women who had prepared it in a large iron kettle. Whilst viewing us, the former asked the latter what he intended to do with his drove, but no reply was made to this inquiry and as our master had, through our whole journey, maintained a steady silence on this subject, I felt a great curiosity to know what disposition he intended to make of the whole gang, and of myself in particular. On their return to the house, I advanced to a small window in the kitchen, which brought me within a few yards of the place where they sat, and from which I was able to hear all they said, although they spoke in a low tone of voice. I here learned that so many of us as could be sold for a good price were to be disposed of in Columbia on our arrival to that place, and that the residue would be driven to Augusta and sold there. The landlord assured my master that at this time slaves were much in demand, both in Columbia and Augusta, that purchasers were numerous and prices good, and that the best plan of effecting good sales would be to put up each nigger separately, at auction, after giving a few days' notice by an advertisement in the neighboring country. Cotton, he said, had not been higher for many years, and as a great many persons, especially young men, were moving off to the new purchase in Georgia, prime hands were in high demand, 
for the purpose of clearing the land in the new country that the boys and girls under 20 would bring almost any price at present in Colombia for the purpose of picking the growing crop of cotton, which promised to be very heavy. And as most persons had planted more than their hands would be able to pick, young niggers who would soon learn to pick cotton were prime articles in the market. As to those more advanced in life, he seemed to think the prospect of selling them at an unusual price not so good, as they could not so readily become expert cotton pickers. He said further that for some cause which he could not comprehend, the price of rice had not been so good this year as usual, and that he had found it cheaper to purchase rice to feed his own niggers than to provide them with corn, which had to be brought from the upper country. He therefore advised my master not to drive us towards the rice plantation of the low country. My master said he would follow his advice, at least so far as to sell a portion of us in Carolina, but seemed to be of opinion that his prime hands would bring him more money in Georgia, and named me, in particular, as one who would be worth at least a thousand dollars to a man who was about making a settlement and clearing a plantation in the new purchase. I therefore concluded that in the course of events I was likely to become the property of a Georgian, which turned out in the end to be the case, though not as soon as I at this time apprehended. I slept but little this night, feeling a restlessness when no longer in chains, and pondering over the future lot of my life, which appeared fraught only with evil and misfortune. Day at length dawned, and with its first light we were ordered to betake ourselves to the road, which, we were told, would lead us to Columbia, the place of intended sale of some, if not all of us. For several days past I had observed that in the country through which we traveled, little attention was paid to the cultivation of anything but cotton. Now this plant was almost the sole possessor of the fields. It covered the plantations adjacent to the road as far as I could see, both before and behind me, and looked not unlike buckwheat before it blossoms. I saw some small fields of corn and lots of sweet potatoes amongst which the young vines of the watermelon were frequently visible. The improvements on the plantations were not good. There were no barns, but only stables and sheds to put the cotton under as it was brought from the field. Hay seemed to be unknown in the country, for I saw neither haystacks nor meadows, and the few fields that were lying fallow had but small numbers of cattle in them, and these were thin and meager. We had met with no flocks of sheep of late, and the hogs that we saw on the roadside were in bad condition. The horses and mules that I saw in the cotton fields were poor and badly harnessed, and the half-naked condition of the negroes who drove them or followed with the hoe together with their wan complexions proved to me that they had too much work or not enough food. We passed a cotton gin this morning, the first that I ever saw, but they were not at work with it. We also met a party of ladies and gentlemen on a journey of pleasure, riding in two very handsome carriages drawn by sleek and spirited horses, very different in appearance from the moving skeletons that I had noticed drawing the plows in the fields. The black drivers of the coaches were neatly clad in gay-colored clothes, and contrasted well with their half-naked brethren, a gang of whom were hoeing cotton by the roadside, near them attended by an overseer in a white linen shirt and pantaloons, with one of the long negro whips in his hand. I observed that these poor people did not raise their heads to look at either the fine coaches and horses then passing or at us, but kept their faces steadily bent towards the cotton plants, 
from among which they were removing the weeds. I almost shuddered at the sight, knowing that I myself was doomed to a state of servitude equally cruel and debasing, unless, by some unforeseen occurrence, I might fall into the hands of a master of less inhumanity of temper than the one who had possession of the miserable creatures before me. End of chapter 2 Recording by Tom Cosby Chapter 3 of Fifty Years in Chains, or The Life of an American Slave. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Cosby. Fifty Years in Chains, or The Life of an American Slave, by Charles Ball. Chapter 3. It was manifest that I was now in a country where the life of a black man was no more regarded than that of an ox, except as far as the man was worth the more money in the market. On all the plantations that we passed, there was a want of livestock of every description, except slaves, and they were deplorably abundant. The fields were destitute of everything that deserved the name of grass, and not a spear of clover was anywhere visible. The few cattle that existed were browsing on the boughs of the trees in the woods. Everything betrayed a scarcity of the means of supplying the slaves who cultivated the fast cotton fields with a sufficiency of food. We traveled this day more than 30 miles and crossed the Catawba River in the afternoon, on the bottoms of which I saw, for the first time, fields of rice growing in swamps covered with water. Causeways were raised through the lowlands in which the rice grew, and on which the road was formed on which we traveled. These rice fields, or rather swamps, had in my eyes a beautiful appearance. The rice was nearly two feet in height above the water, and of a vivid green color, covering a large space of at least a hundred acres. Had it not been for the water, which appeared stagnant and sickly, and swarmed with frogs and thousands of snakes, it would have been as fine a sight as one need wish to look upon. After leaving the low grounds along the river, we again entered plantations of cotton, which lined the roads on both sides, relieved here and there by cornfields and potato patches. We stopped for the night at a small tavern, and our master said we were within a day's journey of Columbia. We here, again, received boiled rice for supper without salt or any kind of seasoning. A pint was allotted to each person, which we greedily devoured, having had no dinner today save an allowance of corn cakes with the fat of about five pounds of bacon, extracted by frying, in which we dipped our bread. I slept soundly after this day's march, the fatigues of the body having, for once, overcome the agitations of the mind. The next day, which was, if my recollection is accurate, the ninth of June, was the last of our journey before our company separated and we were on the road before the stars had disappeared from the sky. Our breakfast this morning consisted of bacon soup, a dish composed of cornmeal boiled in water with a small piece of bacon to give the soup a taste of meat. For dinner we had boiled Indian peas with a small allowance of bacon. This was the first time that we had received two rations of meat in the same day on the whole journey, and some of our party were much surprised at the kindness of our master. But I had no doubt that his object was to make us look fat and hearty, to enable him to obtain better prices for us at Columbia. 
At supper this night we had corn mush and large wooden trays with melted lard to dip the mush in before eating it. We might have reached Columbia this day if we had continued our march, but we stopped at least an hour before sunset about three miles from town at the house of a man who supported the double character of planter and keeper of a house of entertainment, for I learned from his slaves that their master considered it disreputable to be called a tavern keeper and would not put up a sign, although he received pay of such persons as lodged with him. His house was a frame building, weather-boarded with pine boards, but had no plastering within. The furniture corresponded with the house which contained it, and was both scanty and mean, consisting of pine tables and wooden chairs, with bottoms made of corn husks. The house was only one story high, and all the rooms, six or seven in number, parlor, bedrooms, and kitchen, were on the first floor. As the weather was warm and the windows open, I had an opportunity of looking into the sleeping rooms of the family as I walked round the house, which I was permitted freely to do. The beds and their furniture answered well to the chairs and tables. Yet in the large front room I observed on an old-fashioned sideboard a great quantity of glassware of various descriptions, with two or three dozen silver spoons, a silver tea urn, and several knives and forks with silver handles. In the corner of this room stood a bed with gaudy red curtains, with figures of lions, elephants, naked negroes, and other representations of African scenery. The master of the house was not at home when we arrived, but came in from the field shortly afterwards. He met my master with the cordiality of an old friend, though he had never seen him before, said he was happy to see him at his house, and that the greatest pleasure he enjoyed was derived from the entertainment of such gentlemen as thought proper to visit his house, that he was always glad to see strangers, and more especially gentlemen who were adding so much to the wealth and population of Carolina as those merchants who imported servants from the north. He then observed that he had never seen a finer lot of property pass his house than we were and that any gentleman who brought such a stock of hands into the country was a public benefactor, and entitled to the respect and gratitude of every friend of the South. He assured my master that he was happy to see him at his house, and that if he thought proper to remain a few days with him, it would be his chief business to introduce him to the gentlemen of the neighborhood, who would all be glad to become acquainted with a merchant of his respectability. In the state of Maryland, my master had been called a Negro buyer or Georgia trader, sometimes a Negro driver, but here I found that he was elevated to the rank of merchant, and a merchant of the first order too, for it was very clear that in the opinion of the landlord, no branch of trade was more honorable than the traffic in us poor slaves. Our master observed that he had a mind to remain here a short time and try what kind of market Columbia would present for the sale of his lot of servants, and that he would make his house his home until he had ascertained what could be done in town, and what demand there was in the neighborhood for servants. We were not called slaves by these men who talked of selling us, and of the price we would bring, with as little compunction of conscience as they would have talked of the sale of so many mules. It is the custom throughout all the slave-holding states, amongst people of fashion, never to speak of their Negroes as slaves, but always as servants. But I had never before met with the keeper of a public house in the country who had arrived at this degree of refinement. I had been accustomed to hear this order of men, and indeed 
the greater number of white people speak of the people of color as niggers. We remained at this place more than two weeks, I presume because my master found it cheaper to keep us here than in town, or perhaps because he supposed we might recover from the hardships of our journey more speedily in the country. As it was here that my real acquaintance with South Carolina commenced, I have noted with more particularity the incidents that occurred than I otherwise should have done. This family was composed of the husband, wife, three daughters, all young women, and two sons, one of whom appeared to be about twenty and the other perhaps seventeen years old. They had nine slaves in all, one very old man, quite crooked with years and labor, two men of middle age, one lad, perhaps sixteen, one woman with three children, the oldest about seven, and a young girl of twelve or fourteen. The farm or plantation they lived on contained about one hundred and fifty acres of cleared land, sandy, and the greater part of it poor, as was proved by the stinted growth of the cotton. At the time of our arrival at this house, I saw no persons about it except the four ladies, the mother and her three daughters, the husband being in the field as noticed above. According to the orders of my master, I had taken the saddle from his horse and put him in a stable, and it was not until after the first salutations of the new landlord to my master were over that he seemed to think of asking him whether he had come on foot, on horseback, or in a coach. He at length, however, turned suddenly and asked him, with an air of surprise, where he had left his horses and carriage. My master said he had no carriage, that he traveled on horseback, and that his horse was in the stable. The landlord then apologized for the trouble he must have had in having his horse put away himself, and said that at this season of the year the planters were so hurried by their crops and found so much difficulty in keeping down the grass that they were generally obliged to keep all their servants in the field, that for his part he had been compelled to put his coachman and even the waiting maids of his daughters into the cotton fields, and that at this time his family were without servants, a circumstance that had never happened before. For my part, said he, I have always prided myself on bringing up my family well, and can say that although I do not live in so fine a house as some of the other planters of Carolina, yet my children are as great ladies and gentlemen as any in the state. Not one of them has ever had to do a day's work yet, and as long as I live, never shall. I sent two of my daughters to Charleston last summer, and they were there three months, and I intend to send the youngest there this summer. They have all learned to dance here in Columbia, where I sent them two quarters to a Frenchman, and he made me pay pretty well for it. They went to the same dancing school with the daughters of Wade Hampton and Colonel Fitzhugh. I am determined that they shall never marry any but gentlemen of the first character and I know they will always follow my advice in matters of this kind. They are prudent and sensible girls, and are not going to do as Major Pollock's daughter did this spring, who ran away with a Georgia cracker, who brought a drove of cattle for sale from the Indian country, and who had not a nigger in the world. He stayed with me some time, and wished to have something to say to my second daughter. But the thing would not do. Here he stopped short in his narrative, and seeming to muse a moment, said to his guest, I presume as you travel alone, you have no family. No, replied my master, I am a single man. I thought so by your appearance, said the loquacious landlord, and I shall be glad to introduce you to my family this evening. My sons are two as fine fellows as there are in all Carolina. My oldest boy is lieutenant in the militia, and in the same company that marched with General Marion in the war. 
He was on the point of fighting a duel last winter with young McCorkle in Columbia, but the matter was settled between them. You will see him this evening when he returns from the quiet party. A quiet party of young bucks meet once every week about two miles from this, and as I wish my sons to keep the best company, they both attend it. There is to be a cock fight there this afternoon, and my youngest son, Edmund, has the finest cock in this country. He is one of the true game blood, the real Dominica game breed, and I sent to Charleston for his gaffes. There is a bet of ten dollars aside between my son's cock and the one belonging to young Blaney, the son of Major Blaney. Young Blaney is a hot-headed young blood and has been concerned in three duels, though I believe he never fought but one. But I know Edmund will not take a word from him, and it will be well if he and his cock do not both get well licked. Here the conversation was arrested by the sound of horses' feet on the road, and in the next instant two young men rode up at a gallop, mounted on lean-looking horses, one of the riders carrying a pole on his shoulder, with a gamecock in a net bag tied to one end of it. On perceiving them, the landlord exclaimed with an oath, "'There's two lads of spirit, stranger, and if you will allow me the liberty of asking you your name, I will introduce you to them.' At the suggestion of his name, my master seemed to hesitate a little, but after a moment's pause said, "'They call me McGiffin, sir.' "'My name is Hulig, sir,' replied the landlord, and I am very happy to be acquainted with you, Mr. McGiffin. At the same time, shaking him by the hand and introducing his two sons, who were by this time at the door. This was the first time I had ever heard the name of my master, although I had been with him five weeks. I had never seen him before the day on which he seized and bound me in Maryland, and as he took me away immediately, I did not hear his name at the time. The people who assisted to fetter me, either from accident or design, omitted to name him, and after we commenced our journey, he had maintained so much distant reserve and austerity of manner towards us all that no one ventured to ask him his name. We had called him nothing but master, and the various persons at whose houses we had stopped on our way knew as little of his name as we did. We had frequently been asked the name of our master, and perhaps had not always obtained credence when we said we did not know it. Throughout the whole journey, until after we were released from our irons, he had forbidden us to converse together beyond a few words in relation to our temporary condition and wants, and as he was with us all day, and never slept out of hearing of us at night, he rigidly enforced his edict of silence. I presume that the reason of this prohibition of all conversation was to prevent us from devising plans of escape. But he had imposed as rigid a silence on himself as was enforced upon us. And after having passed from Maryland to South Carolina in his company, I knew no more of my master than that he knew how to keep his secrets, guard his slaves, and make a close bargain. I had never heard him speak of his home or family, and therefore had concluded that he was an unmarried man and an adventurer who felt no more attachment for one place than another, and whose residence was not very well settled. But, from the large sums of money which he must have been able to command and carry with him to the north, to enable him to purchase so large a number of slaves, I had no doubt that he was a man of consequence and consideration in the place from whence he came. In Maryland, I had always observed that men who were the owners of large stocks of Negroes were not averse to having publicity given to their names, and that the possession of this species of property even there gave its owner more vanity and egotism than fell to the lot of the holders of any other kind of estate. And in truth, my subsequent experience 
proved that without the possession of slaves, no man could ever arrive at or hope to rise to any honorable station in society. Yet, my master seemed to take no pride in having at his disposal the lives of so many human beings. He never spoke to us in words of either pity or hatred, and never spoke of us except to order us to be fed or watered, as he would have directed the same offices to be performed for so many horses, or to inquire where the best prices could be obtained for us. He regarded us only as objects of traffic and the materials of his commerce, and although he had lived several years in Carolina and Georgia, and had there exercised the profession of an overseer, he regarded the southern planters as no less the subjects of trade and speculation than the slaves he sold to them, as will appear in the sequel. It was to this man that the landlord introduced his two sons, and upon whom he was endeavoring to impose a belief that he was the head of a family which took rank with those of the first planters of the district. The ladies of the household, though I had seen them in the kitchen when I walked round the house, had not yet presented themselves to my master, nor indeed were they in a condition to be seen anywhere but in the apartment they occupied at the time. The young gentleman gave a very gasconading account of the court party and cockfight from which they had just returned, and according to their version of the affair, it might have been an assemblage of at least half the military officers of the state, for all the persons of whom they spoke were captains, majors, and colonels. The eldest said he had won two bowls of punch at Quartz, and the youngest, whose cock had been victor in the battle, on which ten dollars were staked, vaunted much of the qualities of his bird, and supported his veracity by numerous oaths, and reiterated appeals to his brother for the truth of his assertions. Both these young men were so much intoxicated that they with difficulty maintained an erect posture in walking. By this time the sun was going down, and I observed two female slaves, a woman and girl, approaching the house on the side of the kitchen from the cotton field. They were coming home to prepare supper for the family. The ladies whom I had seen in the kitchen, not having been there for the purpose of performing the duties appropriate to that station, but having sought it as a place of refuge from the sight of my master, who had approached the front of their dwelling silently, and so suddenly as not to permit them to gain the foot of the stairway in the large front room without being seen by him, to whose view they by no means wished to expose themselves before they had visited their toilets. About dark, the supper was ready in the large room, and, as it had two fronts, one of which looked into the yard where my companions and I had been permitted to seat ourselves, and had an opportunity of seeing, by the light of the candle, all that was done within, and of hearing all that was said. The ladies, four in number, had entered the room before the gentlemen, and when the latter came in, my master was introduced by the landlord to his wife and daughters by the name and title of Colonel McGiffin, which, at that time, impressed me with the belief that he was really an officer, and that he had disclosed this circumstance without my knowledge. But I afterwards perceived that in the South it is deemed respectful to address a stranger by the title of Colonel or Major or General, if his appearance will warrant the association of so high a rank with his name. My master had declared his intention of becoming the inmate of this family for some time, and no pains seemed to be spared on their part to impress upon his mind the high opinion that they entertained of the dignity of the owner of fifty slaves the possession of so large a number of human creatures being, in Carolina, 
a certificate of character, which entitles its bearer to enter whatever society he may choose to select, without anything more being known of his birth, his life, or reputation. The man who owns fifty servants must needs be a gentleman amongst the higher ranks, and the owner of half a hundred niggers is a sort of nobleman amongst the low, the ignorant, and the vulgar. The mother and three daughters, whose appearance, when I saw them in the kitchen, would have warranted the conclusion that they had just risen from bed without having time to adjust their dress, were now gaily, if not neatly, attired. And the two female slaves, who had come from the field at sundown to cook the supper, now waited at the table. The landlord talked much of his crops, his plantation and slaves, and of the distinguished families who exchanged visits with his own. But my master took very little part in the conversation of the evening, and appeared disposed to maintain the air of mystery which had hitherto invested his character. After it was quite dark, the slaves came in from the cotton field, and taking little notice of us, went into the kitchen, and each, taking thence a pint of corn, proceeded to a little mill, which was nailed to a post in the yard, and there commenced the operation of grinding meal for their suppers, which were afterwards to be prepared by baking the meal into cakes at the fire. The woman, who was the mother of the three small children, was permitted to grind her allowance of corn first, and after her came the old man and the others in succession. After the corn was converted into meal, each one kneaded it up with cold water into a thick dough, and raking away the ashes from a small space on the kitchen hearth, placed the dough rolled up in green leaves in the hollow, and covering it with hot embers, left it to be baked into bread, which was done in about half an hour. These loaves constituted the only supper of the slaves belonging to this family, for I observed that the two women who had waited at the table after the supper of the white people was disposed of also came with their corn to the meal on the post and ground their allowance like the others. They had not been permitted to taste even the fragments of the meal that they had cooked for their masters and mistresses. It was eleven o'clock before these people had finished their supper of cakes, and several of them, especially the younger of the two lads, were so overpowered with toil and sleep that they had to be roused from their slumbers when their cakes were done to devour them. We had for our supper tonight a pint of boiled rice to each person and a small quantity of stale and very rancid butter from the bottom of an old keg or firkin which contained about two pounds, the remnant of that which once filled it. We boiled the rice ourselves in a large iron kettle, and, as our master now informed us that we were to remain here some time, Many of us determined to avail ourselves of this season of respite from our toils, to wash our clothes, and free our persons from the vermin which had appeared amongst our party several weeks before, and now begun to be extremely tormenting. As we were not allowed any soap, we were obliged to resort to the use of a very fine and unctuous kind of clay resembling fuller's earth, but of a yellow color, which was found on the margin of a small swamp near the house. This was the first time that I had ever heard of clay being used for the purpose of washing clothes, but I often availed myself of this resource afterwards whilst I was a slave in the South. We wet our clothes, then rubbed this clay all over the garments, and by scouring it out in warm water with our hands, the cloth, 
whether of woolen or cotton or of linen texture, was entirely clean. We subjected our persons to the same process, and in this way freed our camp from the host of enemies that had been generated in the course of our journey. This washing consumed the whole of the first day of our residence on the plantation of Mr. Hulig. We all lay the first night in his shed or summer kitchen, standing behind the house, and a few yards from it a place in which the slaves of the plantation washed their clothes and passed their Sundays in warm weather when they did not work. But as this place was quite too small to accommodate our party, or indeed to contain us, without crowding us together in such a manner as to endanger our health, we were removed, the morning after our arrival, to an old, decayed, frame building about 100 yards from the house, which had been erected, as I learned, for a cotton gin, but into which its possessor, for want of means, I presume, had never introduced the machinery of the gin. This building was near 40 feet square, was without any other floor than the earth, and neither doors nor windows to close the openings which had been left for the admission of those who entered it. We were told that in this place the cotton of the plantation was deposited in the picking season as it was brought from the field until it could be removed to a neighboring plantation where there was a gin to divest it of its seeds. Here we took our temporary abode, men and women, promiscuously. Our provisions, whilst we remained here, were regularly distributed to us, and our daily allowance to each person consisted of a pint of corn, a pint of rice, and about three or four pounds of butter, such as we had received on the night of our arrival, divided amongst us in small pieces from the point of a table knife. The rice we boiled in the iron kettle. We ground our corn at the little mill on the post in the kitchen and converted the meal into bread in the manner we had been accustomed to at home, sometimes on the hearth and sometimes before the fire on a hoe. The butter was given us as an extraordinary ration to strengthen and recruit us after our long march and give us a healthy and expert appearance at the time of our future sale. We had no beds of any kind to sleep on, but each one was provided with a blanket which had been the companion of our travels. We were left entirely at liberty to go out or in when we pleased, and no watch was kept over us either by night or day. Our master had removed us so far from our native country that he supposed it impossible for any of us ever to escape from him and surmount all the obstacles that lay between us and our former homes. He went away immediately after we were established in our new lodgings and remained absent until the second evening about sundown when he returned, came into our shed, sat down on a block of wood in the midst of us and asked if any one had been sick if we had got our clothes clean, and if we had been supplied with an allowance of rice, corn, and butter. After satisfying himself upon these points, he told us that we were now at liberty to run away if we chose to do so, but if we made the attempt, we should most certainly be retaken and subjected to the most terrible punishment. I never flog, said he. My practice is to cat haul. And if you run away, and I catch you again, as I surely shall do, and give you one cat hauling, you will never run away again, nor attempt it. I did not then understand the import of cat hauling, but in after times became well acquainted with its signification. We remained in this place nearly two weeks, 
during which time our allowance of food was not buried and was regularly given to us. We were not required to do any work, and I had liberty and leisure to walk about the plantation and make such observations as I could upon the new state of things around me. Gentlemen and ladies came every day to look at us with the view of becoming our purchasers, and we were examined with minute care as to our ages, former occupations, and capacity of performing labor. Our persons were inspected, and more especially the hands were scrutinized, to see if all the fingers were perfect and capable of the quick motions necessary in picking cotton. Our master only visited us once a day, and sometimes he remained absent two days, so that he seldom met any of those who came to see us. But whenever it so happened that he did meet them, he laid aside his silence and became very talkative, and even animated in his conversation, extolling our good qualities and averring that he had purchased some of us of one colonel and others of another general in Virginia, that he could by no means have procured us had it not been that, in some instances, our masters had ruined themselves and were obliged to sell us to save their families from ruin, and in others that our owners were dead, their estates deeply in debt, and we had been sold at public sale, by which means he had become possessed of us. He said our habits were unexceptionable, our characters good, that there was not one among us all who had ever been known to run away or steal anything from our former masters. I observed that running away and stealing from his master were regarded as the highest crimes of which a slave could be guilty, but I heard no questions asked concerning our propensity to steal from other people besides our masters, and I afterwards learned that this was not always regarded as a very high crime by the owner of a slave, provided he would perpetrate the theft so adroitly as not to be detected in it. We were severally asked by our visitors if we would be willing to live with them, if they would purchase us, to which we generally replied in the affirmative. But our owner declined all the offers that were made for us, upon the ground that we were too poor, looked too bad to be sold at present, and that in our condition he could not expect to get a fair value for us. One evening, when our master was with us, a thin, sallow-looking man rode up to the house, and alighting from his horse, came to us and told him that he had come to buy a boy that he wished to get a good field hand and would pay a good price for him. I never saw a human countenance that expressed more of the evil passions of the heart than did that of this man, and his conversation corresponded with his physiognomy. Every sentence of his language was accompanied with an oath of the most vulgar profanity and his eyes appeared to me to be the index of a soul as cruel as his visage was disgusting and repulsive. After looking at us for some time, this wretch singled me out as the object of his choice, and coming up to me, asked me how I would like him for a master. In my heart I detested him. But a slave is often afraid to speak the truth and divulge all he feels. So with myself in this instance, as it was doubtful whether I might not fall into his hands and be subject to the violence of his temper. I told him that if he was a good master, as every gentleman ought to be, I should be willing to live with him. He appeared satisfied with my answer and turning to my master, said he would get a high price for me. I can, said he, by going to Charleston, buy as many Guinea Negroes as I please for two hundred dollars each. But as I like this fellow, I will give you four hundred for him. 
This offer struck terror into my heart, for I knew it was as much as was generally given for the best and ablest slaves, and I expected that it would immediately be accepted as my price, and that I should be at once consigned to the hands of this man, of whom I had formed so abhorrent an opinion. To my surprise and satisfaction, however, my master made no reply to the proposition, but stood for a moment with one hand raised to his face and his forefinger on his nose, and then turning suddenly to me said, Go into the house. I shall not sell you today. It was my business to obey the order of departure, and as I went beyond the sound of their voices, I could not understand the purport of the conversation which followed between these two traffickers in human blood. But after a parley of about a quarter of an hour, the hated stranger started abruptly away, and going to the road, mounted his horse, and rode off at a gallop, banishing himself and my fears together. I did not see my master again this evening, and when I came out of our barracks in the morning, although it was scarcely daylight, I saw him standing near one corner of the building, with his head inclined towards the wall, evidently listening to catch any sounds within. He ordered me to go and feed his horse, and have him saddled for him by sunrise. About an hour afterwards, he came to the stable in his riding dress, and told me that he should remove us all to Columbia in a few days. He then rode away, and did not return until the third day afterwards. End of chapter 3 Recording by Tom Cosby Chapter 4 of Fifty Years in Chains, or The Life of an American Slave by Charles Ball. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Salma Yasser. It was now about the middle of June, the weather excessively warm and from eleven o'clock a.m. until late in the afternoon, the sand about our residence was so hot that we couldn't stand on it with our bare feet in one posture more than one or two minutes. The whole country, so far as I could see, appeared to be a dead plain, without the least variety of either hell or dale. The pine was so far the predominating timber of the forest, that at a little distance the entire woods appeared to be composed of this tree. I had become weary of being confined to the immediate vicinity of our lodging, and determined to venture out into the fields of the plantation, and see the manner of cultivating cotton. Accordingly, after I had made my morning meal upon corn cakes, I sallied out in the direction which I had seen the slaves of the plantation take at the time they left the house at daylight, and following a path through a small field of corn, which was so tall as to prevent me from seeing beyond it, I soon arrived at the field in which the people were at work with hoes amongst the cotton, which was about two feet and a half high, and had formed such long branches that they could no longer plow in it without breaking it. Expecting to pass the remainder of my life in this kind of labor, I felt anxious to know the evils, if any, attending it, and more especially the manner in which the slaves were treated on the cotton estate. The people now before me were all diligently and laboriously weeding and hauling the cotton with hoes, and when I approached them, they scarcely took time to speak to me but continued their labor as if I hadn't been present. As there didn't appear to be any overseer with them, I thought I would go amongst them and enter into conversation with them. But upon addressing myself to one of the men, and telling him, if it wasn't disagreeable to him, I should be glad to be acquainted with him, he said he should be glad to be acquainted with me, 
but Master Tom didn't allow him to talk much to people when he was at work. I asked him where his Master Tom was, but before he had time to reply, someone called, Mind your work there, you rascals! Looking in the direction of the sound, I saw Master Tom sitting under the shade of a sassafras tree at a distance of about a hundred yards from us, deeming it unsafe to continue in the field without the permission of his lord. I approached the sassafras tree with my hat in my hand and, in a very humble manner, asked leave to help the people work a while, as I was tired of staying about the house and doing nothing. He said he didn't care. I might go and work with them a while, but I must take care not to talk too much and keep his hands from their work. Now, having authority on my side, I returned, and taking a hoe from the hands of a small girl, told her to pull up weeds, and I would take her row for her. When we arrived at the end of the rows which we were then hilling, Master Tom, who still held his post under the sassafras tree, called his people to come to breakfast. Although I had already broken my fast, I went with the rest for the purpose of seeing what their breakfast was composed of. At the tree I saw a keg which contained about five gallons with water in it, and a gourd lying by it. Near this was a basket made of splits, large enough to hold more than a pick. It contained the breakfast of the people covered by some green leaves of the magnolia, or great bay tree of the south. When the leaves were removed, I found that the supply of provisions consisted of one cake of cornmeal, weighing about half a pound for each person. This bread had no sort of seasoning, not even salt, and constituted the only breakfast of these poor people, who had been toiling from early dawn until about eight o'clock. There was no cake for me, and Master Tom didn't say anything to me on the state of my stomach. But the young girl, whose hoe I had taken in the field, offered me a part of her cake, which I refused. After the breakfast was dispatched, we again returned to our work, but the master ordered the girl, whose hoe I had, to go and get another hoe, which lay at some distance in the field, and take her row again. I continued in the field until dinner which took place about one o'clock, and was the same in all respects as the breakfast had been. Master Tom was the younger of the two brothers who returned from the cockfight on the evening of our arrival at this place. He left the field about ten o'clock, and was succeeded by his elder brother as overseer for the remainder of the day. After this change of superintendence, my companions became more loquacious, and in the course of an hour or two, I had become familiar with the condition of my fellow laborers, who told me that the elder of their young masters was much less tyrannical than his younger brother, and that whilst the former remained in the field, they would be at liberty to talk as much as they pleased, provided they didn't neglect their work. One of the men, who appeared to be about forty years of age, and who was the foreman of the field, told me that he had been born in South Carolina, and had always lived there, though he had only belonged to his present master about ten years. I asked him if his master allowed him no meat, nor any kind of provisions except bread, to which he replied that they never had any meat except at Christmas, when each hand on the place received about three pounds of pork. That from September, when the sweet potatoes were at the maturity of the cross, they had an allowance of potatoes as long as the crop held out, which was generally until about March. But that for the rest of the year they had nothing but a peck of corn a week, with such weeds and other vegetables as they could gather from the fields for greens, that their master didn't allow them any salt, and that the only means they had of procuring this luxury was by working on Sundays for the neighboring planters, who paid them in money at the rate of fifty cents per day with which they purchased salt and some other articles of convenience. This man told me that his master furnished him with two shirts of tow linen and two pairs of trousers, one of woolen and the other of linen cloth, one woolen jacket and one blanket every year, 
that he received the woolen clothes at Christmas, and the linen at Easter, and the other clothes, if he had any, he was obliged to provide for himself while working on Sunday. He said that for several years past he had not been able to provide any clothes for himself, as he had a wife with several children on an adjoining plantation. His master gave only one suit of clothes in the year to the mother, and none of any kind to the children, which had compelled him to lay out all his savings in providing clothes for his family. And such little necessities as were called for by his wife from time to time, he had not had a shoe in his food for several years, but in winter made a kind of moccasin for himself of the bark of a tree, which he said was abundant in the swamps, and could be so manufactured as to make good ropes and tolerable moccasins, sufficient at least to defend the feet from the frost, though not to keep them dry. The old man, whom I have alluded to before, was in the field with the others, though he was not able to keep up with his row. He had no clothes on him except the remains of an old shirt, which hung in tatters from his neck and arms. The two young girls had nothing on them but petticoats, made of coarse toed clothes, and the woman, who was the mother of the children, wore the remains of a tall linen shift, the front part of which was entirely gone, and a piece of old cotton bagging tied around her loins served the purposes of an apron. The younger of the two boys was entirely naked. The man who was foreman of the field was a person of good sense for the condition of life in which fortune had placed him, and spoke to me freely of his hard lot. I observed that under his shirt, which was very red, he wore a piece of fine linen cloth, apparently part of an old shirt, wrapped closely around his back, and confined in front by strings, tied down his breast. I asked him why he wore that piece of gentleman's linen under his shirt, and shall give his reply in his own words, as well as I can recollect them, at a distance of near thirty years. I've always been a hard-working man, and have suffered a great deal from hunger in my time. It's not possible for a man to work hard every day for several months, and get nothing but a pick of corn a week to eat, and not feel hungry. When a man is hungry, you know, if you have ever been hungry, he must eat whatever he can get. I haven't tasted meat since last Christmas, and we have had to work uncommonly hard this summer. Master has a flock of sheep that run in the woods, and they come every night to sleep in the lane near the house. Two weeks ago, last Saturday, when we quit work at night, I was very hungry. And as we went to the house, we passed along the lane where the sheep lay. There were nearly fifty of them, and some were very fat. The temptation was more than I could bear. I cut one of them, cut its head off with the hoe that I carried on my shoulder, and threw it under the fence. About midnight, when all was still about the house, I went out with a knife, took the sheep into the woods, and dressed it by the light of the moon. The carcass I took home, and after cutting it up, placed it in the great kettle over a good fire, intending to boil it and divide it when cooked, between my fellow slaves, whom I knew to be as hungry as I was, and myself. Unfortunately for me, Master Tom, who had been out amongst his friends that day, hadn't returned at that time, and about one o'clock in the morning, at the time when I had a blazing fire under the kettle, I heard the sound of the feet of a horse coming along the lane. The kitchen walls were open so that the light of my fire couldn't be concealed, and in a moment I heard the horse blowing at the front of the house. Conscious of my danger, I stripped my shirt from my back and pushed it into the boiling kettle, so as wholly to conceal the flesh of the sheep. I had scarcely completed this act of precaution when Master Tom burst into the kitchen, and with a terrible oath, asked me what I was doing so late at night, with a great fire in the kitchen. I replied, I'm going to wash my shirt, master, and I'm boiling it to get it clean. Washing your shirt at this time of night, said he, I will let you know that you're not to sit up all night and be lazy and good for nothing all day. 
There shall be no boiling of shirts here on Sunday morning. And thrusting his skin into the kettle, he raised my shirt out and threw it on the kitchen floor. He didn't at first observe the mutton, which was to the surface of the water as soon as the shirt was removed. But after giving the shirt a kick towards the door, he again turned his face to the fire, and seeing a leg standing several inches out of the pot, he demanded of me what I had in there, and where I had got this meat. Finding that I was detected, and that the whole matter must be discovered, I said, Master, I'm hungry and I'm cooking my supper. What is it you have in here? A sheep, said I, and as the words were uttered, he knocked me down with his cane, and after beating me severely, ordered me to cross my hands until he bound me fast with the rope that hung in the kitchen, and answered the double purpose of a clothes line and a cord to tie us with when we were to be whipped. He put out the fire under the kettle, drew me into the yard, tied me fast to the mill-post, and leaving me there for the night, went and called one of the negro boys to put his horse in the stable, and went to his bed. The cord was bound so tightly round my wrists that before morning the blood had burst out under my fingernails, but I suppose my master slept soundly for all that. I was afraid to call anyone to come and release me from my torment, lest a still more terrible punishment might overtake me. I was permitted to remain in this situation until long after sunrise the next morning, which being Sunday was quiet and still, my fellow slaves being permitted to take the rest after the severe toll of the past week, and my old master and two young ones having no occasion to rise to call the hands to the field didn't think of interrupting their morning slumbers to release me from my painful confinement. However, when the sun was risen about an hour, I heard the noise of persons moving in the great house, and soon after a loud and boisterous conversation, which I well knew, portended no good to me. At length, the old three came into the yard where I lay lashed to the post, and approaching me, my old master asked me if I had any accomplices in stealing the sheep. I told them none, that it was entirely my own act, and that none of my fellow slaves had any hand in it. This was the truth, but if any of my companions had been concerned with me, I shouldn't have betrayed them, for such an act of treachery could not have alleviated the dreadful punishment which I knew awaited me and would only have involved them in the same misery. They called me a thief, loaded me with oaths and imprecations, and each one proposed the punishment which he deemed the most appropriate to the enormity of the crime that I had committed. Master Tom was of opinion that I should be lashed to the post of the foot of a chalet, and that each of my fellow slaves should be compelled to give me a dozen lashes in turn, with a roasted and greased hickory, gap until I had received, in the hall, two hundred and fifty lashes on my bare back, and that he would stand by, with the whip in his hand, and compel them not to spare me. But after a short debate this was given up, as it would probably render me unable to work in the field again for several weeks. My master Ned was in favor of giving me a dozen lashes every morning for a month, with the whip, but my old master said, this would be attended with too much trouble, and besides, it would keep me from my work at least half an hour every morning, and proposed in his turn that I should not be wept at all, but that the carcass of the sheep should be taken from the kettle in its half-boiled condition, and hung up in the kitchen loft without salt, and that I should be compelled to subsist on this putrid mutton without any other food, until it should be consumed. This suggestion met the approbation of my young masters, and would have been adopted, had not mistress at this moment come into the yard, and hearing the intended punishment, loudly objected to it, because the mutton would in a day or two create such an offensive stench that she and my young mistresses would not be able to remain in the house. My mistress swore dreadfully, and cursed me for an ungrateful sheep-thief, 
who, after all her kindness in giving me soup and warm bread when I was sick last winter, was always stealing everything I could get hold of. She then said to my master that such villainy ought not to be passed over in a slight manner, and that as crimes such as this concerned the whole country, my punishment ought to be public for the purpose of example, and advised him to have me whipped that same afternoon at five o'clock, first giving notice to the neighborhood to come and see the spectacle and to bring with them their slaves that they might be witnesses to the consequences of stealing sheep. They then returned to the house to breakfast, but as the pain in my hands and arms produced by the ligatures of the cord with which I was bound was greater than I could bear, I now felt exceedingly sick and lost all knowledge of my situation. They told me I fainted, and when I recovered my faculties, I found myself lying in the shade of the house, with my hands free, and all the white persons in my master's family standing around me. As soon as I was able to stand, the rope was tied round my neck, and the other end again fastened to the mill-post. My mistress said I had only pretended to faint, and Master Tom said I would have something worth fainting for before night. He was faithful to his promise, but for the present I was suffered to sit on the grass in the shade of the house. As soon as breakfast was over, my two young masters had their horses saddled and set out to give notice to their friends of what had happened and to invite them to come and see me punished for the crime I had committed. My mistress gave me no breakfast, and when I begged one of the black boys whom I saw looking at me through the pails to bring me some water and a gourd to drink, she ordered him to bring it from a puddle in the lane. My mistress has always been very cruel to all her black people. I remained in this situation until about eleven o'clock, when one of my young mistresses came to me and gave me a piece of johnny cake about the size of my hand perhaps larger than my hand, telling me at the same time that my fellow slaves had been permitted to reap all the mutton that I had left in the kettle and make their breakfast of it, but that her mother would not allow her to give me any part of it. It was well for them that I had parboiled it with my shirt and so defiled it that it was unfit for the table of my master, otherwise no portion of it would have fallen to the black people, as it was they had as much meat as they could consume in two days, for which I had to suffer. About twelve o'clock, one of my young masters returned, and soon afterwards the other came home. I heard them tell my old master that they had been round to give notice of my offence to the neighboring planters, and that several of them would attempt to see me flogged, and would bring with them some of their slaves who might be able to report to their companions what had been done to me for stealing. It was late in the afternoon before any of the gentlemen came, but before five o'clock there were more than twenty white people and at least fifty black ones present, the latter of whom had been compelled by their masters to come and see me punished. Amongst others, an overseer from a neighboring estate attended and to him was awarded the office of executioner. I was stripped of my shirt, and the waistband of my trousers was drawn closely round me, below my hips, so as to expose the whole of my back in its entire length. It seems that it had been determined to beat me with thongs of raw cowhide, where the overseer had two of these in his hands, each about four feet long. But one of the gentlemen present said this might bruise my back so badly that I could not work for some time, perhaps not for a week or two, and as I could not be spared from the field without disadvantage to my master's crop, he suggested a different plan, by which, in his opinion, the greatest degree of pain could be inflicted on me, with the least danger of rendering me unable to work. As he was a large planter, and had more than fifty slaves, all were disposed to be guided by his counsels, and my master said he would submit the matter entirely to him as a man of judgment and experience in such cases. He then desired my master to have a dozen pods of red pepper, boiled in a half gallon of water, 
and desired the overseer to lay aside his songs of rawhide, and put a new cracker of silk to the lash of his negro whip. While these preparations were being made, each of my thumbs were lashed closely to the end of a stick about three feet long, and a chair being placed beside the mill post, I was compelled to raise my hands and place the stick to which my thumbs were bound over the top of the post, which is about eighteen inches square. The chair was then taken from under me, and I was left hanging by the thumbs, with my face towards the post and my feet about a foot from the ground. My two great toes were then tied together and drawn down the post as far as my joints could be stretched. The cord was passed round the post two or three times and securely fastened. In this posture I had no power of motion except in my neck, and could only move that at the expense of beating my face against the side of the post. The pepper tea was now brought and poured into a basin to cool and the overseer was desired to give me a dozen lashes just above the waistband and not to cover a space of more than four inches on my back from the waistband upwards he obeyed the injunction faithfully but slowly and each crack of the whip was followed by a sensation as painful as if a red-hot iron had been drawn across my back when the twelve strokes had been given the operation was suspended and the black man one of the slaves present was compelled to wash the gashes in my skin with the scalding pepper tea, which was yet so hot that he could not hold his hands in it. This doubly burning liquid was thrown into my row and bleeding wounds, and produced a tormenting smart beyond the description of language. After the delay of ten minutes by the watch, I received another dozen lashes on the part of my back which was immediately above the bleeding and burning gashes of the former whipping, and again the biting, stinging pepper tea was applied to my lacerated and trembling muscles. This operation was continued at regular intervals until I had received ninety-six slashes, and my back was cut and scalded from end to end. Every stroke of the whip had drawn blood. Many of the gashes were three inches long, my back burned as if it had been covered by a coat of hot embers mixed with living coals, and I felt my flesh quiver like that of animals that have been slaughtered by the butcher and are flayed while yet half alive. My face was bruised, and my nose bled profusely, for in the madness of my agony I hadn't been able to refrain from beating my head violently against the post. Vainly did I beg and implore for mercy. I was kept bound to the post with my whole weight hanging upon my thumbs an hour and a half, but it appeared to me that I had entered upon eternity, and that my sufferings would never end. At length, however, my feet were unbound, and afterwards my hands, but when released from the cords I was so far exhausted as not to be able to stand, and my thumbs were stiff and motionless. I was carried into the kitchen and laid on a blanket when my mistress came to see me, and after looking at my lacerated back and telling me that my wounds were only skin deep, said I had come off well after what I had done, and that I ought to be thankful that it was not worth with me. She then bade me not to groan so loud nor make so much noise and left me to myself. I lay in this condition until it was quite dark, by which time the burning of my back had much abated, and was succeeded by an aching soreness, which rendered me unable to turn over or bend my spine in the slightest manner. My mistress again visited me, and brought with her about half a pound of fat bacon, which she made one of the black women roast before the fire on a fork, until the oil ran freely from it, and then rubbed it warm over my back. This was repeated until I was greased from the neck to the hips, effectually. An old blanket was then thrown over me, and I was left to pass the night alone. Such was the terror striking into my fellow slaves by the example made of me, that although they loved and pitied me, not one of them dared to approach me during this night. My strength was gone, and I at length fell asleep, from which I didn't awake until the horn was blown the next morning to call the people to the corn crib, 
to receive the weekly allowance of a peck of corn. I didn't rise, nor attempt to join the other people, and shortly afterwards my master entered the kitchen, and in a soft and gentle tone of voice asked me if I was dead. I answered him that I was not dead, and making some effort, found I was able to get upon my feet. My master had become frightened when he missed me at the corn crib, and being suddenly seized with an apprehension that I was dead, his heart had become softened, not with compassion for my sufferings, but with the fear of losing his best field hand. But when he saw me stand before him erect and upright, the recollection of the lost sheep revived in his mind, and with it all his feelings of revenge against the author of its death. So you're not dead yet, you thieving rascal, said he, and cursing me with many better offers, ordered me to go along to the crib and get my corn, and go to the work with the rest of the hands. I was forced to obey, and taking my basket of corn from the door of the crib, placed it in the kitchen loft, and went to the field with the other people. Weak and exhausted as I was, I was compelled to do the work of an able hand, but was not permitted to taste the mutton which was all given to the others, who were carefully guarded while they were eating, lest they should give me some of it. This man's back was not yet well. Many of the gashes made by the lash were yet sore, and those that were healed had left long white strips across his body. He had no notion of leaving the service of his tyrannical master, and his spirit was so broken and subdued that he was ready to suffer and bear all his hardships, not indeed without complaining, but without attempting to resist his oppressors or to escape from their power. I saw him often while I remained at this place, and ventured to tell him once that if I had a master who would abuse me as he had abused him, I would run away. Where could I run, or in what place could I conceal myself, said he. I have known many slaves who ran away but they were always caught and treated worse afterwards than they had been before. I have heard that there is a place called Philadelphia, where the black people are all free, but I do not know which way it lies, nor what road I should take to go there. And if I knew the way, how could I hope to get there? Would not the petrol be sure to catch me? I pitied this unfortunate creature, and was at the same time fearful that in a short time I should be equally the object of pity myself. How well my fears were justified, the sequel of my narrative will show. End of chapter 4 Recorded by Salma Yasser. Chapter 5 of Fifty Years in Chains, or the Life of an American Slave. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by San Maeser. We had been stationed in the old cotton gin house about twenty days, had recovered from the fatigue of our journey and were greatly improved in our strength and appearance. When our master returned one evening, after an absence of two days, and told us that we must go to Columbia the next day, and must, for this purpose, have our breakfast ready by sunrise. On the following morning he called us at daylight, and we made all dispatch in preparing our morning repast, the last that we were to take in our present residence. As our equipment consisted of a few clothes we had on our person and a solitary blanket to each individual, our baggage was easily adjusted, and we were on the road before the sun was up half an hour, and in less than an hour we were in Columbia, drawn up in a long line in the street opposite the courthouse. The town, which was small and mean-looking, was full of people and I believe that more than a thousand gentlemen came to look at us within the course of this day. We were kept in the street about an hour, and were then taken into the jail yard and permitted to sit down, but were not shut up in the jail. The court was sitting in Columbia at this time, and either the circumstance 
or the intelligence of our arrival in the country, or both, had drawn together a very great crowd of people. We were supplied with vegetables by the jailer, and had small allowance of salt pork for dinner. We slept in the jail at night, and as none of us had been sold on the day of our arrival in Colombia, and we had not heard any of the persons who came to look at us make proposals to our master for our purchase, I suppose it might be his intention to drive us still farther south before he offered us for sale. But I discovered my error on the second day, which was Tuesday. This day the crowd in town was much greater than it had been on Monday, and about ten o'clock our master came into the yard in company with the jailer, and after looking at us some time, the latter addressed us in a short speech, which continued perhaps five minutes. In this harangue, he told us we had come to live in the finest country in the world, that South Carolina was the richest and best part of the United States, and that he was going to sell us to gentlemen who would make us all very happy and would require us to do no hard work, but only raise cotton and pick it. He then ordered a handsome and lad, about eighteen years of age, to follow him into the street, where he observed a great concourse of persons collected. Here the jailer made another harangue to the multitude, in which he assured them that he was about to sell the most valuable lot of slaves that had ever been offered in Colombia, that we were all young, in excellent health, of good habits, having been all purchased in Virginia from the estates of tobacco planters, and that there was not one in the whole lot who had lost the use of a single finger, or was blind of an eye. He then cried the poor lad for sale, and the first bid he received was two hundred dollars. Others quickly succeeded, and the boy, who was a remarkably handsome youth, was striking up in a few minutes to a young man who appeared not much older than himself, at three hundred and fifty dollars. The purchaser paid down his price to our master on a table in the jail, and the lad, after bidding us farewell, followed his new master with tears running down his cheeks. He next sold a young girl, about fifteen or sixteen years old, for two hundred and fifty dollars to a lady who attended the sales in her carriage, and made her beds out of the window. In this manner the sales were continued for about two hours and a half, when they were adjourned until three o'clock. In the afternoon they were again resumed and kept open until about five o'clock when they were closed for the day. As my companions were sold, they were taken from amongst us, and we saw them no more. The next morning before day, I was awakened from my sleep by the sound of several heavy fires of cannon, which were discharged, as it seemed to me, within a few yards of the place where I lay. These were succeeded by fives and drums, and all the noise with which I had formerly heard the 4th of July ushered in at the navy yard in washington since i had left maryland i had carefully kept the reckoning of the days of the week but had not been careful to note the dates of the month yet as soon as the daylight appeared and the door of our apartment was opened i inquired and learned that this was as i had supposed it to be the day of universal rejoicing i understood that the court didn't sit this day but a great crowd of people gathered and remained around the jail all the morning many of whom were intoxicated and sang and shouted in honor of free government and the rights of man. About eleven o'clock, a long table was spread under a row of trees, which grew in the street, not far from the jail, and which appeared to me to be the kind called in Pennsylvania, the pride of China. At this table, several hundred persons sat down to dinner soon after noon, and continued to eat and drink, and sing songs in honor of liberty for more than two hours. At the end of the dinner, a gentleman rose and stood up his chair, near one end of the table, and begged the company to hear him for a few minutes. He informed them that he was a candidate for some office, but what office it was I do not recollect, and said that as it was an acknowledged principle of our free government, that all men were born free and equal, he presumed it would not be deemed an act of arrogance in him to call upon them for their votes at the coming election. This first speaker was succeeded by another, who addressed his audience in nearly the same language, and after he had concluded, the company broke up. 
I heard a black man that belonged to the jailer, or who was at least in his service, say there had been a great meeting that morning in the courthouse, at which several gentlemen had made speeches. When I lived at the navy yard, the officers sometimes permitted me to go up down with them on the 4th of July and listen to the fine speeches that were made there on such occasions. About five o'clock the jailer came and stood at the front door of the jail and proclaimed in a very loud voice that a sale of most valuable slaves would immediately take place, that he had sold many fine hands yesterday, but they were only the refuse and the most worthless part of the whole lot, that those who wished to get great bargains and prime property had better attempt now, as it was certain that such negroes had never been offered for sale in Colombia before. In a few minutes, the whole assembly that had composed the dinner party and hundreds of others were convened around the jail door, and the jailer again proceeded with his auction. Several of the stoutest men and the handsomest women in the whole company had been reserved for this day, and I perceived that the very best of us were kept back for the last. We went off at rather better places than had been obtained on the former day, and I perceived much eagerness amongst the bidders many of whom were not sober. Within less than three hours, only three of us remained in the jail, and we were ordered to come and stand at the door, in front of the crier, who made a most extravagant eulogium upon our good qualities and capacity to perform labor. He said, These three fellows are as strong as horses, and as patient as mules. One of them can do as much work as two common men, and they are perfectly honest. Mr. M. Giffen says he was assured by the former masters that they were never known to steal or run away. They must bring good prices, gentlemen, or they will not be sold. Their master is determined that if they don't bring six hundred dollars, he will not sell them, but will take them to Georgia next summer and sell them to some of the new settlers. These boys can do anything. This one, referring to me, can cut five cords of food in a day and put it up. He's a rough carpenter and a first-rate field hand. This one, laying his hand on the shoulder of one of my companions, is a blacksmith and can lay a plow share, put new steel upon an axe or mend broken chains. The other, he recommended as a good shoemaker and well acquainted with the process of tanning leather. We were nearly of the same age and very stout, healthy, robust young men, in full position of our corporal powers, and if we had been shut up in a room with ten of the strongest of those who had assembled to purchase us, and our liberty had depended on tying them fast to each other, I have no doubt that we should have been free if ropes had been provided for us. After a few minutes of hesitancy amongst the purchasers and a closer examination of our persons, that had been made in the jail yard, an elderly gentleman said he would take the carpenter, and the blacksmith and shoemaker were immediately taken by others at the required price. It was now sundown. The heat of the day had been very oppressive, and I was glad to be released from the confined air of the jail and the hot atmosphere in which so many hundreds were breathing. My new master asked me my name and ordered me to follow him. We proceeded to a tavern, where a great number of persons were assembled. At a short distance from the jail, my master entered the house and joined in the conversation of the party, in which the utmost hilarity prevailed. They were drinking toasts in honor of liberty and independence. Over glasses of toddy, a liquor composed of a mixture of rum, water, sugar, and nutmeg. It was ten o'clock at night before my master and his companions had finished their toasts and toddy, and all this time I had been standing before the door, or sitting on a log of wood that lay in front of the house. At one time I took a seat on a bench at the side of the house, but was soon driven from this position by a gentleman in military clothes, with a large gilt epaulette on each shoulder and a profusion of glittering bottles on his coat. So passing near me in the dark and happening to cast his eye on me, demanded of me, in an imperious tone, how I dared to sit on that seat. I told him I was a stranger, and didn't know that it was wrong to sit here. He then ordered me with an oath to be gone from there, 
and said, if he caught me on that bench again, he would cut my head off. Did you not see what people said upon the bench, you saucy rascal? said he. I assured him I hadn't seen any white gentleman sit on the bench as it was near night when I came to the house, that I had not intended to be saucy or misbehave myself, and that I hoped he would not be angry with me. As my master had left me at the door and hadn't told me where I was to sit, I remained on the log until the termination of the festival, in honor of liberty and equality, when my master came to the door and observed in my hearing to some of his friends that they had celebrated the day in a handsome manner. No person except the military gentleman had spoken to me since I came to the house in the evening with my master, who seemed to have forgotten me, for he remained at the door, warmly engaged in conversation on various political subjects, a full hour after he rose from the toast party. At length, however, I heard him say, I bought a negro this evening. I wonder where he is. Rising immediately from the log, on which I had been so long seated, I presented myself before him and said, Here, master. He had then ordered me to go to the kitchen of the inn and go to sleep, but said nothing to me about supper. I retired to the kitchen, where I found a large number of servants, who belonged to the house, and among them two young girls, who had been purchased by gentlemen who lived near Augusta, and who, they told me, intended to set out for his plantation the next morning, and take them with him. These girls had been sold out of our company on the first day, and had been living in the tavern kitchen since that time. They appeared quite contented, and they meant no repugnance to settling out the next morning for their master's plantation. They were of that order of people who never looked beyond the present day, and so long as they had plenty of vegetables in this kitchen, they didn't trouble themselves with reflections upon the company. One of the servants gave me some cold meat and a piece of sweetened bread, which was the first I had tasted since I left Maryland, and indeed it was the last that I tasted until I reached Maryland again. I here met with a man who was born and brought up in the northern neck of Virginia, on the banks of the Potomac, and within a few miles of my native place, we soon formed an acquaintance and sat up nearly all night. He was the chief hustler in the stable of this tavern, and told me that he had often thought of attempting to escape and return to Virginia. He said he had little doubt of being able to reach the Potomac, but having no knowledge of the country beyond the river, he was afraid that he should not be able to make his way to Philadelphia, which he regarded as the only place in which he could be safe from the pursuit of his master. I was myself then young, and my knowledge of the country north of Baltimore was very vague and undefined. I, however, told him that I had heard that if a black man could reach any part of Pennsylvania, he would be beyond the reach of his pursuers. He said he could not justly complain of want of food, but the services required of him were so unreasonable, and the punishment frequently inflicted upon him so severe, that he was determined to set out for the north, as soon as the corn was so far ripe as to be fit to be roasted. He felt confident that by lying in the woods and unfrequented places all day, and traveling only by night, he could escape the vigilance of all and gain the northern neck, before the corn would be gathered from the fields. He had no fear of wanting food, as he could live well on roasting ears, as long as the corn was in the milk, and afterwards on parched corn, as long as the grain remained in the field. I advised him as well as I could as to the best means of reaching the state of Pennsylvania, but was not able to give him any very definite instructions. This man possessed a very sound understanding, and having been five years in Carolina, was well acquainted with the country. He gave me such an account of the sufferings of the slaves on the cotton and indigo plantations, of whom I now regarded myself as one, that I was unable to sleep any this night. From the resolute manner in which he spoke of his intended elopement and the regularity with which he had connected the various combinations of the enterprise, I have no doubt that he undertook that which he intended to perform. Whether he was successful or not in the enterprise, I cannot say, 
as I never saw him nor heard of him after the next morning. This man certainly communicated to me the outlines of the plan, which I afterwards put in execution, and by which I gained my liberty, at the expense of sufferings, which none can appreciate, except those who have borne all that the stoutest human constitution can bear, of cold and hunger, toil and pain. The conversation of this slave arose in my breast so many recollections of the past and fears of the future that I didn't lie down, but sat on an old chair until daylight. From the people of the kitchen I again received some cold vegetables for my breakfast, but I didn't see my master until about nine o'clock. The toddy of the last evening causing him to sleep late this morning. At length, a female slave gave me notice that my master wished to see me in the dining room, whether I repaired without a moment's delay. When I entered the room, he was sitting near the window, smoking a pipe with a very long handle, I believe more than two feet in length. He asked no questions, but addressed me with the title of Bowie, ordered me to go with the hostler of the inn, and get his horse and cheese ready. As soon as this order could be executed, I informed him that his chaise was at the door, and we immediately commenced our journey to the plantation of my master, which, he told me, lay at the distance of twenty miles from Columbia. He said I must keep up with him, and, as he drove at the rate of five or six miles an hour, I was obliged to run nearly half the time, but I was then young, and could easily travel fifty or sixty miles in a day. It was with great anxiety that I looked for the place, which was in future to be my home. But this didn't prevent me from making such observations upon the state of the country through which we traveled, as the rapidity of our marsh permitted. This whole region had originally been one vast wilderness of pine forests, except the low grounds and river bottoms, here called swamps in which all the varieties of trees, shrubs, vines, and plants peculiar to such places in southern latitudes vegetated in unrestrained luxuriance. Nor is pine the only timber that grows on the upland, in this part of Carolina, although it is the predominant tree, and in some places prevails to the exclusion of every other. Oak, hickory, sassafras, and many others are found. Here, also, I first observed groves of the most beautiful of all the trees of the wood, the great southern magnolia, or green bay. No adequate conception can be formed of the appearance or the fragrance of this most magnificent tree by anyone who has not seen it, or scented the air when scented by the perfume of its flowers. It rises in a right line to the height of seventy or eighty feet. The stem is of a delicate pepper form and casts off numerous branches in nearly right angles with itself, the extremities of which decline gently towards the ground and become shorter and shorter in the ascent, until at the apex of the tree they are scarcely a foot in length, whilst below they are many times found twenty feet long. The immense cones formed by these trees are as perfect as the diminutive form which nature exhibits in the burr of the pine tree. The leaf of the magnolia is smooth, of an oblong taper form, about six inches in length and half as broad. Its color is the deepest and purest green. The foliage of the bay tree is as impervious as a break wall to the rays of the sun, and its refreshing coolness in the heat of a summer day affords one of the greatest luxuries of a cotton plantation. It blooms in May and bears great numbers of broad, expanded white flowers, the odor of which is exceedingly grateful and so abundant that I have no doubt that a group of these trees in full bloom may be smelled at a distance of fifteen or twenty miles. I've heard it asserted in the South that their scent has been perceived by persons fifty or sixty miles from them. This tree is one of nature's most splendid, and in the climate where she has placed it, one of her most agreeable productions. It is peculiar to the southern temperate latitudes, and cannot bear the rigors of a northern winter, though I have heard that groves of the bay are found on Fishing Creek in western Virginia, not far from Wheeling, and near the Ohio River. Could this tree be naturalized in Pennsylvania, it would form an ornament to her town cities and country seats, 
at once the most tasteful and the most delicious. A forest of these trees in the month of May resembles a wood involved in an untimely fall of snow at midsummer, glowing in the rays of a morning sun. We passed this day through cotton fields and pine woods alternately, but the scene was sometimes enlivened by the appearance of lots of corn and sweet potatoes, which, I observed, were generally planted near the houses. I afterwards learned that this custom of planting the corn and potatoes near the house of the planter is generally all over Carolina. The object is to prevent the slaves from stealing, and thus procuring more food than, by the laws of the plantation, they are entitled to. In passing through a lane, I this day saw a field which appeared to me to contain about fifty acres, in which people were at work with hoes, amongst a sort of plants that I had never seen before. I asked my master what this was, and he told me it was indigo. I shall have occasion to say more of this plant hereafter. We at last arrived at the residence of my master, who descended from his chaise, and leaving me in charge of the horse at the gate, proceeded to the house across a long courtyard. In a few minutes, two young ladies and a young gentleman came out of the house and walked to the gate, near which I was with the horse. One of the ladies said, they had come to look at me and see what kind of a boy her pa had brought home with him. The other one said I was a very smart-looking boy, and this compliment flattered me greatly. They, being the first kind words that had been addressed to me since I left Maryland, the young gentleman asked me if I could run fast and if I had ever picked cotton. His manner didn't impress me so much in his favor, as the address of his sister had done for her. These three young persons were the son and daughters of my master. After looking at me a short time, my young master, for so I must now call him, ordered me to take the harness from the horse, give him water at a well which was near, and come into the kitchen, where some boiled rice was given me for my dinner. I was not required to go to work this first day of my abode in my new residence, but after I had eaten my rice, my young master told me I might dress myself, or walk out and see the plantation, but that I must be ready to go with the overseer the next morning. End of chapter 5Chapter 6 of Fifty Years in Chains, or The Life of an American Slave. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Casper. Fifty Years in Chains, or The Life of an American Slave, by Charles Ball. Chapter 6. By the laws of the United States, I am still a slave, and though I am now growing old, I might even yet be deemed of sufficient value to be worth pursuing as far as my present residence, if those to whom the law gives the right of dominion over my person and life knew where to find me. For these reasons I have been advised, by those whom I believe to be my friends, not to disclose the true names of any of those families in which I was a slave in Carolina or Georgia, lest this narrative should meet their eyes and in some way lead them to a discovery of my retreat. I was now the slave of one of the most wealthy planters in Carolina, who planted cotton, rice, indigo, corn, and potatoes, and was the master of 260 slaves. The description of one great cotton plantation will give a correct idea of all others, and I shall here present an outline of that of my master's. He lived about two miles from the Caugaree River, which bordered his estate on one side, and in the swamps of which were his rice fields. The country hereabout is very flat, the banks of the river are low, and in wet seasons large tracts of country are flooded by the superabundant water of the river. There are no springs, and the only means of procuring water on the plantations is from wells, which must be sunk in general about twenty feet deep, before a constant supply of water can be obtained. My master had two of these wells on his plantation, 
one at the mansion house and one at the quarter. My master's house was of brick. Brick houses are by no means common among the planters, whose residences are generally built of framework, weather-boarded with pine boards and covered with shingles of the white cedar or juniper cypress, and contained two large parlors and a spacious hall or entry on the ground floor. The main building was two stories high, and attached to this was a smaller building, one story and a half high, with a large room where the family generally took breakfast, with a kitchen at the farther extremity from the main building. There was a spacious garden behind the house, containing, I believe, about five acres, well cultivated and handsomely laid out. In this garden grew a great variety of vegetables, some of which I have never seen in the market of Philadelphia. It contained a profusion of flowers, three different shrubberies, a vast number of ornamental and small fruit trees, and several small hothouses with glass roofs. There was a head gardener who did nothing but attend to this garden through the year, and during the summer he generally had two men and two boys to assist him. In the months of April and May this garden was one of the sweetest and most pleasant places that I ever was in. At one end of the main building was a small house called the library, in which my master kept his books and papers, and where he spent much of his time. At some distance from the mansion was a pigeon house, and near the kitchen was a large wooden building called the kitchen quarter, in which the house servants slept, and where they generally took their meals. Here also the washing of the family was done, and all the rough or unpleasant work of the kitchen department, such as the cleaning and salting fish, putting up pork, etc., was assigned to this place. There was no barn on this plantation, according to the acceptation of the word barn in Pennsylvania, but there was a wooden building, about forty feet long, called the coach house, in one end of which the family carriage and the chaise in which my master rode were kept. Under the same roof was a stable, large enough to contain a dozen horses, in one end the corn intended for the horses was kept, and the whole of one loft was occupied by the blades and tops of the corn. About a quarter of a mile from the dwelling house were the huts or cabins of the plantation slaves, standing in rows. There were thirty-eight of them, generally about sixteen feet square, and provided with pine floors. In these cabins were two hundred and fifty people, of all ages, sexes, and sizes. A short distance from the cabins was the house of the overseer. In one corner of his garden stood a corn crib and a provision house. A little way off stood the house containing the cotton gin. There was no smokehouse, nor any place for curing meat, and while I was on this plantation no food was ever salted for the use of the slaves. I went out into the garden, and after sundown my old master sent me to the overseer's house. He was just coming in from the field, followed by a great number of black people. He asked me my name, and, calling a middle-aged man who was passing us at some distance, told him he must take me to live with him. I followed my new friend to his cabin, which was the shelter of his wife and five children. The only furniture consisted of a few blocks of wood for seats, a short bench made of a pine board which served as a table, and a small bed in one corner, composed of a mat made of common rushes, spread upon some corn husks, pulled and split into fine pieces, and kept together by a narrow slip of wood, confined to the floor by wooden pins. There was a common iron pot standing beside the chimney, and several wooden spoons and dishes hung against the wall. Several blankets also hung against the wall, upon wooden pins. An old box made of pine boards, without either lock or hinges, occupied one corner. At the time I entered this humble abode, the mistress was not at home. She had not yet returned from the field. Having been sent, as the husband informed me, with some other people, late in the evening— to do some work in a field about two miles distant. I found a child about a year old lying on the mat bed, and a little girl about four years old sitting beside it. These children were entirely naked, 
And when we came to the door, the elder rose from its place and ran to its father, and clasping him round one of his knees, said, Now we shall get good supper. The father laid his hand upon the head of his naked child, and stood silently looking in its face, which was turned upward toward his own for a moment, and then, turning to me, said, Did you leave any children at home? The scene before me, the question propounded, and the manner of this poor man and his child, caused my heart to swell until my breast seemed too small to contain it. My soul fled back upon the wings of fancy to my wife's lowly dwelling in Maryland, where I had been so often met on a Saturday evening when I paid them my weekly visit by my own little ones who clung to my knees for protection and support, even as the poor little wretch now before me seized upon the weary limb of its hapless and destitute father, hoping that, naked as he was, for he too was naked save only the tattered remains of a pair of old trousers, he would bring with his return at evening its customary scanty supper. I was unable to reply, but stood motionless, leaning against the walls of the cabin. My children seemed to flit by the door in the dusky twilight, and the twittering of a swallow, which at that moment fluttered over my head, sounded in my ear as the infantile tittering of my own little boy. But on a moment's reflection I knew that we were separated, without a hope of ever again meeting, that they no more heard the welcome tread of my feet, and could never again receive the little gifts with which, poor as I was, I was accustomed to present them. I was far from the place of my nativity, in a land of strangers, with no one to care for me beyond the care that a master bestows upon his ox, with all my future life one long, waste, barren desert of cheerless, hopeless, lifeless slavery, to be varied only by the pangs of hunger and the stings of the lash. My reverie was at length broken by the appearance of the mother of the family, with her three eldest children. The mother wore an old ragged shift, but the children, the eldest of whom appeared to be about twelve and the youngest six years old, were quite naked. When she came in, the husband told her that the overseer had sent me to live with them, and she and her oldest child, who was a boy, immediately set about preparing their supper by boiling some of the leaves of the weed called lamb's quarter in the pot. This, together with some cakes of cold cornbread, formed their supper. My supper was brought to me from the house of the overseer by a small girl, his daughter. It was about half a pound of bread, cut from a loaf made of cornmeal, my companions gave me a part of their boiled greens, and we all sat down together to my first meal in my new habitation. I had no bed other than the blanket which I had brought with me from Maryland, and I went to sleep in the loft of the cabin, which was assigned to me as my sleeping room, and in which I continued to lodge as long as I remained on this plantation. The next morning I was waked at the break of day, by the sound of a horn, which was blown very loudly. Perceiving that it was growing light, I came down and went out immediately in front of the house of the overseer, who was standing near his own gate, blowing the horn. In a few minutes the whole of the working people from all the cabins were assembled, and as it was now light enough for me distinctly to see such objects as were about me, I at once perceived the nature of the servitude to which I was in future to be subject. As I have before stated, there were altogether on this plantation two hundred and sixty slaves, but the number was seldom stationary for a single week. Births were numerous and frequent, and deaths were not uncommon. When I joined them, I believe we counted in all two hundred and sixty-three, but of these only one hundred and seventy went to the field to work. The others were children too small to be of any service as laborers, old and blind persons, or incurably diseased. Ten or twelve were kept about the mansion house and garden, chosen from the most handsome and sprightly of the gang. I think about one hundred and sixty-eight assembled that morning at the sound of the horn, two or three being sick, sent word to the overseer that they could not come. 
The overseer wrote something on a piece of paper and gave it to his little son. This, I was told, was a note to be sent to our master, to inform him that some of the hands were sick. It not being any part of the duty of the overseer to attend to a sick negro. The overseer then led off to the field, with his horn in one hand and his whip in the other, we following, men, women, and children, promiscuously, and a wretched-looking troop we were. There was not an entire garment amongst us. More than half of the gang were entirely naked. Several young girls, who had arrived at puberty, wearing only the livery with which nature had ornamented them, and a great number of lads of an equal or superior age appeared in the same costume. There was neither bonnet, cap, nor headdress of any kind amongst us, except the old straw hat that I wore, and which my wife had made for me in Maryland. This I soon laid aside to avoid the appearance of singularity, and, as owing to the severe treatment I had endured whilst traveling in chains, and being compelled to sleep on the naked floor without undressing myself, my clothes were quite worn out. I did not make a much better figure than my companions, though still I preserved the semblance of clothing so far that it could be seen that my shirt and trousers had once been distinct and separate garments. Not one of the others had on even the remains of two pieces of apparel. Some of the men had old shirts and some ragged trousers, but no one wore both. Amongst the women, several wore petticoats, and many had shifts. Not one of the whole number wore both of these vestments. We walked nearly a mile through one vast cotton field before we arrived at the place of our intended day's labor. At last the overseer stopped at the side of the field, and calling to several of the men by name, ordered them to call their companies and turn into their rows. The work we had to do today was to hoe and weed cotton for the last time, and the men whose names had been called, and who were, I believe, eleven in number, were designated as captains, each of whom had under his command a certain number of the other hands. The captain was the foreman of his company, and those under his command had to keep up with him. Each of the men and women had to take one row, and two, and in some cases where they were very small, three of the children had one. The first captain, whose name was Simon, took the first row, and the other captains were compelled to keep up with him. By this means the overseer had nothing to do but to keep Simon hard at work, and he was certain that all the others must work equally hard. Simon was a stout, strong man, apparently about thirty-five years of age, and for some reason unknown to me I was ordered to take a row next to his. The overseer, with his whip in his hand, walked about the field after us to see that our work was well done. As we worked with hoes, I had no difficulty in learning how the work was to be performed. The fields of cotton at this season of the year are very beautiful. The plants among which we worked this day were about three feet high and in full bloom, with branches so numerous that they nearly covered the whole ground, leaving scarcely space enough between them to permit us to move about and work with our hoes. About seven o'clock in the morning the overseer sounded his horn, and we all repaired to the shade of some persimmon trees, which grew in a corner of the field, to get our breakfast. I here saw a cart drawn by a yoke of oxen, driven by an old black man nearly blind. The cart contained three barrels filled with water, and several large baskets full of cornbread that had been baked in the ashes. The water was for us to drink, and the bread was our breakfast. The little son of the overseer was also in the cart, and had brought with him the breakfast of his father in a small wooden bucket. The overseer had bread, butter, cold ham, and coffee for his breakfast. Ours was composed of a corn cake, weighing about three-quarters of a pound, to each person, with as much water as was desired. I at first supposed that this bread was dealt out to the people as their allowance, but on further inquiry I found this not to be the case. Simon, by whose side I was now at work, and who seemed much pleased with my agility and diligence in my duty, told me that here, as well as everywhere in this country, 
Each person received a peck of corn at the crib door every Sunday evening, and that in ordinary times everyone had to grind this corn and bake it for him or herself, making such use of it as the owner thought proper, but that for some time past the overseer, for the purpose of saving the time which had been lost in baking the bread, had made it the duty of an old woman who was not capable of doing much work in the field to stay at the quarter and bake the bread of the whole gang. When baked, it was brought to the field in a cart, as I saw, and dealt out in loaves. They still had to grind their own corn after night, and as there were only three hand mills on the plantation, he said they experienced much difficulty in converting their corn into meal. We worked in this field all day, and at the end of every hour, or hour and a quarter, we had permission to go to the cart, which was moved about the field so as to be near us, and get water. Our dinner was the same in all respects as our breakfast, except that in addition to the bread, we had a little salt and a radish for each person. We were not allowed to rest at either breakfast or dinner longer than while we were eating, and we worked in the evening as long as we could distinguish the weeds from the cotton plants. Simon informed me that formerly, when they baked their own bread, they had left their work soon after sundown to go home and bake for the next day, but the overseer had adopted the new policy for the purpose of keeping them at work until dark. When we could no longer see to work, the horn was again sounded and we returned home. I had now lived through one of the days, a succession of which make up the life of a slave, on a cotton plantation. As we went out in the morning, I observed several women who carried their young children in their arms to the field. These mothers laid their children at the side of the fence, or under the shade of the cotton plants, whilst they were at work, and when the rest of us went to get water, they would go to give suck to their children, requesting someone to bring them water in gourds, which they were careful to carry to the field with them. One young woman did not, like the others, leave her child at the end of the row, but had contrived a sort of rude knapsack made of a piece of coarse linen cloth, in which she fastened her child, which was very young, upon her back, and in this way carried it all day, and performed her task at the hoe with the other people. I pitied her, and as we were going home at night, escorted her and learned her history, she had been brought up a lady's maid, and knew little of hardship, until she was sold south by a dissipated master. On this plantation she was obliged to marry a man she did not like, and was often severely whipped, because she could not do as much work as the rest. I was affected by her story, and the overseer's horn interrupted our conversation, at hearing which she exclaimed, "'We're too late. Let us run, or we shall be whipped.' and setting off as fast as she could run, she left me alone. I quickened my pace, and arrived in the crowd a moment before her. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of Fifty Years in Chains, or The Life of an American Slave This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Casper Fifty Years in Chains, or The Life of an American Slave, by Charles Ball Chapter 7 The overseer was calling over the names of the whole from a little book, and the first name I heard was that of my companion, Lydia. As she did not answer, I said, Master, the woman that carries her baby on her back will be here in a minute. He paid no attention to what I said, but went on with his call. As the people answered to their names, they passed off to the cabins, except three, two women and a man, who, when their names were called, were ordered to go into the yard in front of the overseer's house. My name was the last on the list, and when it was called, I was ordered into the yard with the three others. Just as we had entered, Lydia came up out of breath with the child in her arms, 
and following us into the yard, dropped on her knees before the overseer, and begged him to forgive her. "'Where have you been?' said he. Poor Lydia now burst into tears, and said, "'I only stopped to talk a while to this man, pointing at me. But indeed, Master Overseer, I will never do so again.' "'Lie down,' was his reply. Lydia immediately fell prostrate upon the ground, and in this position he compelled her to remove her old tow linen shift, the only garment she wore, so as to expose her hips, when he gave her ten lashes with his long whip, every touch of which brought blood and a shriek from the sufferer. He then ordered her to go and get her supper, with an injunction never to stay behind again. The other three culprits were then put upon their trial. The first was a middle-aged woman, who had, as her overseer said, left several hills of cotton in the course of the day, without cleaning and hilling them in a proper manner. She received twelve lashes. The other two were charged in general terms with having been lazy and of having neglected their work that day. Each of these received twelve lashes. These people all received punishment in the same manner that it had been inflicted upon Lydia. And when they were all gone, the overseer turned to me and said, Boy, you are a stranger here yet, but I called you in to let you see how things are done here and to give you a little advice. When I get a new negro under my command, I never whip at first. I always give him a few days to learn his duty, unless he is an outrageous villain, in which case I anoint him a little at the beginning. I call over the names of all the hands twice every week, on Wednesday and Saturday evenings, and settle with them according to their general conduct for the last three days. I call the names of my captains every morning, and it is their business to see that they have all their hands in their proper places. You ought not to have stayed behind tonight with Lyd, but as this is your first offense, I shall overlook it, and you may go and get your supper." I made a low bow and thanked Master Overseer for his kindness to me and left him. This night for supper we had cornbread and cucumbers, but we had neither salt, vinegar, nor pepper with the cucumbers. I had never before seen people flogged in the way our overseer flogged his people. This plan of making the person who is to be whipped lie down upon the ground was new to me, although it is much practiced in the South and I have since seen men, and women too, cut nearly in pieces by this mode of punishment. It has one advantage over tying people up by the hands, as it prevents all accidents from sprains in the thumbs and wrists. On Monday morning I heard the sound of the horn at the usual hour, and repairing to the front of the overseer's house, found that he had already gone to the corn crib, for the purpose of distributing corn among the people for the bread of the week, or rather for the week's subsistence, for this corn was all the provision that our master or his overseer usually made for us. I say usually, for whatever was given to us beyond the corn, which we received on Sunday evening, was considered in the light of a bounty bestowed upon us, over and beyond what we were entitled to or had a right to expect to receive. When I arrived at the crib, the door was unlocked and open, and the distribution had already commenced. Each person was entitled to half a bushel of ears of corn, which was measured out by several of the men who were in the crib. Every child above six months old drew this weekly allowance of corn, and in this way women who had several small children had more corn than they could consume and sometimes bartered small quantities with the other people for such things as they needed and were not able to procure. The people received their corn in baskets, old bags, or anything with which they could most conveniently provide themselves. I had not been able since I came here to procure a basket or anything else to put my corn in, and desired the man with whom I lived to take my portion in his basket with that of his family, this he readily agreed to do, and as soon as we had received our share, we left the crib. The overseer attended in person to the measuring of this corn, and it is only justice to him to say that he was careful to see that justice was done us. 
The men who measured the corn always heaped the measure as long as an ear would lie on, and he never restrained their generosity to their fellow slaves. In addition to this allowance of corn, we received a weekly allowance of salt, amounting in general to about half a gill to each person, but this article was not furnished regularly, and sometimes we received none for two or three weeks. The reader must not suppose that on this plantation we had nothing to eat beyond the corn and salt. This was far from the case. I have already described the gardens or patches cultivated by the people, and the practice which they universally followed of working on Sunday for wages. In addition to all these, an industrious managing slave could contrive to gather up a great deal to eat. I have observed that the planters are careful of the health of their slaves, and in pursuance of this rule they seldom expose them to rainy weather, especially in the sickly seasons of the year, if it can be avoided. In the spring and early part of the summer, the rains are frequently so violent and the ground becomes so wet that it is injurious to the cotton to work it, at least whilst it rains. In the course of the year there are many of these rainy days, in which the people cannot go to work with safety, and it often happens that there is nothing for them to do in the house. At such times they make baskets, brooms, horse collars, and other things which they are able to sell amongst the planters. The baskets are made of wooden splits, and the brooms of young white oak or hickory trees. The mats are sometimes made of splits, but more frequently of flags, as they are called, a kind of tall rush which grows in swampy ground. The horse or mule collars are made of husks of corn, though sometimes of rushes, but the latter are not very durable. The money procured by these and various other means, which I shall explain hereafter, is laid out by the slaves in purchasing such little articles of necessity or luxury as it enables them to procure. A part is dispersed in payment for sugar, molasses, and sometimes a few pounds of coffee, for the use of the family. Another part is laid out for clothes for winter, and no inconsiderable portion of his pittance is squandered away by the misguided slave for tobacco and an occasional bottle of rum. Tobacco is deemed so indispensable to comfort, nay to existence, that hunger and nakedness are patiently endured to enable the slave to indulge in this highest of enjoyments. There being few towns in the cotton country, the shops or stores are frequently kept at some crossroad or other public place, in or adjacent to a rich district of plantations. To these shops the slaves resort, sometimes with, and at other times without, the consent of the overseer, for the purpose of laying out the little money they get. Notwithstanding all the vigilance that is exercised by the planters, the slaves, who are no less vigilant than their masters, often leave the plantation after the overseer has retired to his bed and go to the store. The storekeepers are always ready to accommodate the slaves, who are frequently better customers than many white people, because the former always pay cash, whilst the latter almost always require credit. In dealing with the slave, the shopkeeper knows he can demand whatever price he pleases for his goods, without danger of being charged with extortion, and he is ready to rise at any time of the night to oblige friends who are of so much value to him. It is held highly disgraceful on the part of storekeepers to deal with the slaves for anything but money, or the coarse fabrics that it is known are the usual products of the ingenuity and industry of the Negroes. But notwithstanding this, a considerable traffic is carried on between the shopkeepers and slaves, in which the latter make their payments by barter. The utmost caution and severity of masters and overseers are sometimes insufficient to repress the cunning contrivances of the slaves. After we had received our corn, we deposited it in our several houses, and immediately followed the overseer to the same cotton field in which we had been at work on Sunday. Our breakfast this morning was bread, to which was added a large basket of apples from the orchard of our master. These apples served us for a relish with our bread, 
both for breakfast and dinner, and when I returned to the quarter in the evening, Dinah, the name of the woman who was at the head of our family, produced at supper a black jug containing molasses, and gave me some of the molasses for my supper. I felt grateful to Dinah for this act of kindness, as I well knew that her children regarded molasses as the greatest of human luxuries, and that she was depriving them of the highest enjoyment to afford me the means of making a gourd full of molasses and water. I therefore proposed to her and her husband, whose name was Nero, that whilst I should remain a member of the family, I would contribute as much towards its support as Nero himself, or at least that I would bring all my earnings into the family stock, provided I might be treated as one of its members and be allowed a portion of the proceeds of their patch of garden. This offer was very readily accepted, and from this time we constituted one community as long as I remained among the field hands on this plantation. After supper was over, we had to grind our corn, but as we had to wait for our turn at the mill, we did not get through this indispensable operation before one o'clock in the morning. We did not sit up all night to wait for our turn at the mill, but as our several turns were assigned us by lot, the person who had the first turn, when done with the mill, gave notice to the one entitled to the second, and so on. By this means nobody lost more than half an hour's sleep, and in the morning everyone's grinding was done. We worked very hard this week. We were now laying by the cotton, as that is termed. That is, we were giving the last weeding and hilling to the crop, of which there was on this plantation about five hundred acres, which looked well and promised to yield a fine picking. In addition to the cotton, there was on this plantation one hundred acres of corn, about ten acres of indigo, ten or twelve acres in sweet potatoes, and a rice swamp of about fifty acres. The potatoes and indigo had been laid by, that is, the season of working in them was past, before I came upon the estate, and we were driven hard by the overseer to get done with the cotton, to be ready to give the corn another harrowing and hoeing before the season should be too far advanced. Most of the corn in this part of the country was already laid by, but the crop here had been planted late and yet required to be worked. We were supplied with an abundance of bread, for a peck of corn is as much as a man can consume in a week if he has other vegetables with it, but we were obliged to provide ourselves with the other articles necessary for our subsistence. Nero had corn in his patch, which was now hard enough to be fit for boiling, and my friend Lydia had beans in her garden. We exchanged corn for beans and had a good supply of both, but these delicacies we were obliged to reserve for supper. We took our breakfast in the field from the cart, which seldom afforded us anything better than bread, and some raw vegetables from the garden. Nothing of moment occurred amongst us in this first week of my residence here. On Wednesday evening, called Settlement Night, two men and a woman were whipped. But circumstances of this kind were so common that I shall in future not mention them unless something extraordinary attended them. I could make wooden bowls and ladles, and went to work with a man who was clearing some new land about two miles off on the second Sunday of my sojourn here, and applied the money I earned in purchasing the tools necessary to enable me to carry on my trade. I occupied all my leisure hours for several months after this in making wooden trays and such other wooden vessels as were most in demand. These I traded off in part to a storekeeper, who lived about five miles from the plantation, and for some of my work I obtained money. Before Christmas I had sold more than thirty dollars' worth of my manufactures, but the merchant with whom I traded charged such high prices for his goods that I was poorly compensated for my Sunday toils and nightly labors. Nevertheless, by these means I was able to keep our family supplied with molasses and some other luxuries, and at the approach of winter I purchased three coarse blankets, to which Nero added as many, and we had all these made up into blanket coats for Dinah, ourselves, and the children. 
About ten days after my arrival, we had a great feast at the quarter. One night, after we had returned from the field, the overseer sent for me by his little son, and when I came to his house, he asked me if I understood the trade of a butcher. I told him I was not a butcher by trade, but that I had often assisted my master and others to kill hogs and cattle, and that I could dress a hog or a bullock as well as most people. He then told me he was going to have a beef killed in the morning at the great house, and I must do it, that he would not spare any of the hands to go with me, but he would get one of the house boys to help me. When the morning came, I went according to orders to butcher the beef, which I expected to find in some enclosure on the plantation. But the overseer told me I must take a boy named Tony from the house, whose business it was to take care of the cattle, and go to the woods and look for the beef. Tony and I set out some time before sunrise, and went to a cow pen about a mile from the house, where he said he had seen the young cattle only a day or two before. At this cow pen we saw several cows waiting to be milked, I suppose, for their calves were in an adjoining field, and separated from them only by a fence. Tony then said we should have to go to the long savanna, where the dry cattle generally ranged, and thither we set off. This long savanna lay at the distance of three miles from the cow pen, and when we reached it I found it to be literally what it was called, a long savanna. It was a piece of low, swampy ground, several miles in extent, with an open space in the interior part of it, about a mile long, and perhaps a quarter of a mile in width. It was manifest that this open space was covered with water through the greater part of the year, which prevented the growth of timber in this place, though at the time it was dry, except a pond near one end, which covered perhaps an acre of ground. In this natural meadow, every kind of wild grass common to such places in the southern country abounded. Here I first saw the scrub and saw grasses, the first of which is so hard and rough that it is gathered to scrub coarse wooden furniture or even pewter, and the last is provided with edges somewhat like saw teeth, so hard and sharp that it would soon tear the skin off the legs of anyone who should venture to walk through it with bare limbs. As we entered this savanna, we were enveloped in clouds of mosquitoes and swarms of gull nippers that threatened to devour us. As we advanced through the grass, they rose up until the air was thick and actually darkened with them. They rushed upon us with the fury of yellow jackets whose hive has been broken in upon, and covered every part of our persons. The clothes I had on, which were nothing but a shirt and trousers of tow linen, afforded no protection even against the mosquitoes, which were much larger than those found along the Chesapeake Bay, and nothing short of a covering of leather could have defended me against the gall nippers. I was pierced by a thousand stings at one time, and verily believe I could not have lived beyond a few hours in this place. Tony ran into the pond and rolled himself in the water to get rid of his persecutors, but he had not long been there before he came running out as fast as he had gone in, hallooing and clamoring in a manner wholly unintelligible to me. He was terribly frightened, but I could not imagine what could be the cause of his alarm, until he reached the shore, when he turned round with his face to the water and called out, "'The biggest alligator in the whole world! Did, did not you see him?' I told him I had not seen anything but himself in the water." but he insisted that he had been chased in the pond by an alligator which had followed him until he was close into the shore. We waited a few minutes for the alligator to rise to the surface, but were soon compelled by the mosquitoes to quit the place. Tony said we need not look for the cattle here, no cattle could live amongst these mosquitoes, and I thought he was right in his judgment. We then proceeded into the woods and thickets, and after wandering about for an hour or more, we found the cattle, and after much difficulty succeeded in driving a part of them back into the cow pen and enclosing them in it. I here selected the one that appeared to be the fattest, and securing it with ropes, we drove the animal to the place of slaughter. This beef was intended as a feast for the slaves, at the laying by of the corn and cotton, 
and when I had it hung up and had taken the hide off, my young master, whom I had seen on the day of my arrival, came out to me and ordered me to cut off the head, neck, legs, and tail, and lay them, together with the empty stomach and the harslet, in a basket. This basket was sent home to the kitchen of the great house by a woman and a boy who attended for that purpose. I think there was at least one hundred and twenty or thirty pounds of this offal. The residue of the carcass I cut into four quarters, and we carried it to the cellar of the great house. Here one of the hind quarters was salted in a tub for the use of the family, and the other was sent as a present to a planter who lived about four miles distant. The two forequarters were cut into very small pieces and salted by themselves. These, I was told, would be cooked for our dinner on the next day, Sunday, when there was to be a general rejoicing among all the slaves of the plantation. After the beef was salted down, I received some bread and milk for my breakfast, and went to join the hands in the cornfield, where they were now harrowing and hoeing the crop for the last time. The overseer had promised us that we should have holiday after the completion of this work, and by great exertion we finished it about five o'clock in the afternoon. On our return to the quarter, the overseer, at roll call, which he performed this day before night, told us that every family must send a bowl to the great house to get our dinners of meat. This intelligence diffused as much joy amongst us as if each one had drawn a prize in a lottery. At the assurance of a meat dinner, the old people smiled and showed their teeth and returned thanks to Master Overseer, but many of the younger ones shouted, clapped their hands, leaped, and ran about with delight. Each family, or mess, now sent its deputy, with a large wooden bowl in his hand, to receive the dinner at the great kitchen. I went on the part of our family, and found that the meat dinner of this day was made up of the basket of tripe and other offal that I had prepared in the morning. The whole had been boiled in four great iron kettles, until the flesh had disappeared from the bones, which were broken in small pieces, a flitch of bacon, some green corn, squashes, tomatoes, and onions had been added, together with other condiments, and the whole converted into about a hundred gallons of soup, of which I received in my bowl for the use of our family more than two gallons. We had plenty of bread, and a supply of black-eyed peas gathered from our garden, some of which Dinah had boiled in our kettle whilst I was gone for the soup, of which there was as much as we could consume, and I believe that every one in the quarter had enough. I doubt if there was in the world a happier assemblage than ours on this Saturday evening. We had finished one of the grand divisions of the labors of a cotton plantation, and were supplied with a dinner which to most of my fellow slaves appeared to be a great luxury, and most liberal donation on the part of our master, whom they regarded with sentiments of gratitude for this manifestation of his bounty. In addition to present gratification, they looked forward to the enjoyments of the next day, when they were to spend a whole Sunday in rest and banqueting, for it was known that the two forequarters of the bullock were to be dressed for Sunday's dinner, and I had told them that each of these quarters weighed at least one hundred pounds. Our quarter knew but little quiet this night. Singing, playing on the banjo, and dancing occupied nearly the whole community until the break of day. Those who were too old to take any part in our active pleasures beat time with their hands or recited stories of former times. Most of these stories referred to affairs that had been transacted in Africa and were sufficiently fraught with demons, miracles, and murders to fix the attention of many hearers. To add to our happiness, the early peaches were now ripe, and the overseer permitted us to send on Sunday morning to the orchard and gather at least ten bushels of very fine fruit. In South Carolina they have very good summer apples, but they fall from the trees and rot immediately after they are ripe. Indeed, very often they speck rot on the trees before they become ripe. This speck rot, as it is termed, appears to be a kind of epidemic disease amongst apples, for in some seasons whole orchards are subject to it, and the fruit is totally worthless, 
whilst in other years the fruit in the same orchard continues sound and good until it is ripe. The climate of Carolina is, however, not favorable to the apple, and this fruit of so much value in the north is in the cotton region only of a few weeks' continuance, winter apples being unknown. Every climate is congenial to the growth of some kind of fruit tree, and in Carolina and Georgia the peach arrives at its utmost perfection. The fig also ripens well and is a delicious fruit. None of our people went out to work for wages today. Some few devoted a part of the morning to such work as they deemed necessary in or about their patches, and some went to the woods or the swamps to collect sticks for brooms and splits, or to gather flags for mats. But far the greater number remained at the quarter, occupied in some small work, or quietly awaiting the hour of dinner, which we had been informed by one of the house servants would be at one o'clock. Every family made ready some preparation of vegetables from their own garden, to enlarge the quantity, if not to heighten the flavor of the dinner of this day. One o'clock at length arrived, but not before it had been long desired, and we proceeded with our bowls a second time to the great kitchen. I acted, as I had done yesterday, the part of commissary for our family. But when we were already at the place where we were to receive our soup and meat into our bowls, for it was understood that we were with the soup to have an allowance of both beef and bacon today, we were told that puddings had been boiled for us, and that we must bring dishes to receive them in. This occasioned some delay, until we obtained vessels from the quarter. In addition to at least two gallons of soup, about a pound of beef, and a small piece of bacon, I obtained nearly two pounds of pudding made of cornmeal mixed with lard, and boiled in large bags. This pudding, with the molasses that we had at home, formed a very palatable second course to our bread, soup, and vegetables. On Sunday afternoon we had a meeting at which many of our party attended. A man named Jacob, who had come from Virginia, sang and prayed, but a great many of the people went out about the plantation in search of fruits, for there were many peach and some fig trees standing along the fences on various parts of the estate. With us this was a day of uninterrupted happiness. A man cannot well be miserable when he sees everyone about him immersed in pleasure, and though our fare of today was not of a quality to yield me much gratification, yet such was the impulse given to my feelings by the universal hilarity and contentment which prevailed amongst my fellows, that I forgot for the time all the subjects of grief that were stored in my memory, all the acts of wrong that had been perpetrated against me, and entered with the most sincere and earnest sentiments in the participation of the felicity of our community. End of chapter 7、Chapter、eight of Fifty Years in Chains For the life of an American slave. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fifty Years in Chains or the Life of an American Slave by Charles Ball. Chapter 8. At the time of which I now speak, the rice was ripe and ready to be gathered. On Monday morning, after our feast, the overseer took the whole of us to the rice field to enter upon the harvest of this crop. The field lay in a piece of low ground near the river, and in such a position that it could be flooded by the water of the stream in wet seasons. The rice is planted in drills or rows and grows more like oats than any other grain known in the north. The water is sometimes let into the rice fields and drawn off again several times according to the state of the weather. Watering and weeding the rice is considered one of the most unhealthy occupations on a southern plantation, as the people are obliged to live for several weeks in the mud and water, subject to all the unwholesome vapors that arise from stagnant pools under the rays of a summer sun, as well as the chilly autumnal dews of night. At the time we came to cut this rice, the field was quite dry, 
and after we had reaped and bound it, we hauled it upon wagons to a piece of hard ground, where we made a threshing floor and threshed it. In some places they tread out the rice, with mules or horses, as they tread wheat in Maryland, but this renders the grain dusty and is injurious to its sale. After getting in the rice, we were occupied for some time in clearing and ditching swampy land, preparatory to a more extended culture of rice the next year, and about the first of August, twenty or thirty of the people, principally women and children, were employed for two weeks in making cider of apples, which grew in an orchard of nearly two hundred trees, that stood on a part of the estate. After the cider was made, a barrel of it was one day brought to the field and distributed amongst us, but this gratuity was not repeated. The cider that was made by the people was converted into brandy at a still in the corner of the orchard. I often obtained a cider to drink at the still, which was sheltered from the weather by a shed of boards and slabs. We were not permitted to go into the orchard at pleasure, but as long as the apples continued, we were allowed the privilege of sending five or six persons every evening for the purpose of bringing apples to the quarter for our common use, and by taking large baskets and filling them well, we generally contrived to get as many as we could consume. When the peaches ripened, they were guarded with more rigor, peach brandy being an article which is nowhere more highly prized than in South Carolina. There were on the plantation more than a thousand peach trees growing on poor sandy fields, which were no longer worth the expense of cultivation. The best peaches grow upon the poorest sand hills. We were allowed to take three bushels of peaches every day for the use of the quarter, but we could, and did at least three times that quantity, for we stole at night that which was not given us by day. I confess that I took part in these thefts, and I did not feel that I committed any wrong against either God or man by my participation in the common danger that we ran, for we well knew the consequences that would have followed detection. After the feast at laying by the corn and cotton, we had no meat for several weeks, and it is my opinion that our master lost money by the economy he practiced at this season of the year. I now entered upon a new scene of life. My true value had not yet been ascertained by my present owner, and whether I was to hold the rank of a first or second-rate hand could only be determined by an experience of my ability to pick cotton. I had ascertained that at the hoe, the spade, the sickle, or the flail I was full match for the best hands on the plantation, but soon discovered when we came to cotton-picking I was not equal to a boy of fifteen. I worked hard the first day, but when evening came and our cotton was weighed, I had only thirty-eight pounds, and was vexed to see that two young men about my own age had one fifty-eight and the other fifty-nine pounds. This was our first day's work, and the overseer had not yet settled the amount of a day's picking. It was necessary for him to ascertain by the experience of a few days how much the best hands could pick in a day, before he established the standard of the season. I hung down my head and felt very much ashamed of myself when I found that my cotton was so far behind that of many, even the woman who had heretofore regarded me as the strongest and most powerful man of the whole gang. I had exerted myself today to the utmost of my power, and as the picking of cotton seemed to be so very simple a business, I felt apprehensive that I should never be able to improve myself so far as to become even a second-rate hand. In this posture of affairs I looked forward to something still more painful than the loss of character which I must sustain, both with my fellows and my master, for I knew that the lash of the overseer would soon become familiar with my back if I did not perform as much work as any of the other young men. I expected, indeed, that it would go hard with me even now, and stood by with feelings of despondence and terror, whilst the other people were getting their cotton weighed. When it was all weighed, the overseer came to me where I stood and told me to show him my hands. When I had done this and he had looked at them, he observed, You have a pair of good hands. You will make a good picker. This faint praise of the overseer revived my spirits greatly, and I went home with a lighter heart than I had expected to possess before the termination of cotton picking. When I came to get my cotton weighed on the evening of the second day, I was rejoiced to find that I had forty-six pounds. 
although I had not worked harder than I did the first day. On the third evening I had fifty-two pounds, and before the end of the week there were only three hands in the field, two men and a young woman who could pick more cotton in a day than I could. On the Monday morning of the second week, when we went to the field, the overseer told us that he fixed the day's work at fifty pounds, and that all those who picked more than that would be paid a cent a pound for the overplus. Twenty-five pounds was assigned to the daily task of the old people as well as a number of boys and girls, while some of the women who had children were required to pick forty pounds, and several children had ten pounds each as their task. Picking of cotton may almost be reckoned among the arts. A man who has arrived at the age of twenty-five before he sees a cotton field will never, in the language of the overseer, become a crack picker. By great industry and vigilance, I was able, at the end of a month, to return every evening a few pounds over the daily rate for which I received my pay. But the business of picking cotton was a fatiguing labor to me, and one to which I never became reconciled, for the reason that in every other kind of work I was called a first-rate hand, whilst in cotton picking I was hardly regarded as a prime hand. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9, Part 1 of Fifty Years in Chains, or The Life of an American Slave. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White. Fifty Years in Chains, or The Life of an American Slave by Charles Ball. Chapter 9, Part 1. It is impossible to reconcile the mind of the native slave to the idea of living in a state of perfect equality and boundless affection with the white people. Heaven will be no heaven to him if he is not to be avenged of his enemies. I know from experience that these are the fundamental rules of his religious creed, because I learned them in the religious meetings of the slaves themselves. A favorite and kind master or mistress may now and then be admitted into heaven, but this rather as a matter of favor to the intercession of some slave than as matter of strict justice to the whites, who will by no means be of an equal rank with those who shall be raised from the depths of misery in this world. The idea of a revolution in the conditions of the whites and the blacks is the cornerstone of the religion of the latter, and indeed it seems to me, at least, to be quite natural, if not in strict accordance with the precepts of the Bible. For in that book I find it everywhere laid down that those who have possessed an inordinate portion of the good things of this world, and have lived in ease and luxury at the expense of their fellow men, will surely have to render an account of their stewardship, and be punished for having withheld from others the participation of those blessings which they themselves enjoyed. There is no subject which presents to the mind of the male slave a greater contrast between his own condition and that of his master than the relative station and appearance of his wife and his mistress. The one, poorly clad, poorly fed, and exposed to all of the hardships of the cotton field, the other, dressed in clothes of gay and various colors, ornamented with jewelry and carefully protected from the rays of the sun and the blasts of the wind. As I have before observed, the Africans have feelings peculiar to themselves, but with an American slave, the possession of the spacious house, splendid furniture, and fine horses of his master are but the secondary objects of his desires. To fill the measure of his happiness and crown his highest ambition, his young and beautiful mistress must adorn his triumph and enliven his hopes. I have been drawn into the above reflections, by the recollection of an event of a most melancholy character, which took place when I had been on this plantation about three months. Among the house servants of my master was a young man named Hardy, of a dark yellow complexion, a quadroon or mulatto, one-fourth of whose blood was transmitted from white parentage. Hardy was employed in various kinds of work about the house and was frequently sent on errands, sometimes on horseback. I had become acquainted with the boy who had often come to see me at the quarter, 
and had sometimes stayed all night with me, and often told me of the ladies and gentlemen who visited at the great house. Amongst others, he frequently spoke of a young lady who resided six or seven miles from the plantation, and often came to visit the daughters of the family in company with her brother, a lad about twelve or fourteen years of age. He described the great beauty of this girl whose mother was a widow living on a small estate of her own. This lady did not keep a carriage, but her son and daughter, when they went abroad, traveled on horseback. One Sunday, these two young people came to visit at the house of my master, and remained until after tea in the evening. As I did not go out to work that day, I went over to the great house and from the house to a place in the woods about a mile distant, where I had set snares for rabbits. This place was near the road, and I saw the young lady and her brother on their way home. It was after sundown when they passed me, but as the evening was clear and pleasant, I supposed they would get home soon after dark, and that no accident would befall them. No more was thought of the matter this evening, and I heard nothing further of the young people until the next day, about noon, when a black boy came into the field, where we were picking cotton, and went to the overseer with a piece of paper. In a short time the overseer called me to come with him, and leaving the field with the hands under the orders of Simon, the first captain, we proceeded to the great house. As soon as we arrived at the mansion, my master, who had not spoken to me since the day we came from Columbia, appeared at the front door and ordered me to come in and follow him. He led me through a part of the house and passed into the back yard, where I saw the young gentleman, his son, another gentleman whom I did not know, the family doctor, and the overseer, all standing together and in earnest conversation. At my appearance, the overseer opened a cellar door and ordered me to go in. I had no suspicion of evil, and obeyed the order immediately, as indeed I must have obeyed it, whatever might have been my suspicions. The overseer and the gentleman all followed, and as soon as the cellar door was closed after us by someone whom I could not see, I was ordered to pull off my clothes and lie down on my back. I was then bound by the hands and feet with strong cords, and extended at full length between two of the beams that supported the timbers of the building. The stranger, who I now observed was much agitated, spoke to the doctor, who then opened a small case of surgeon's instruments, which he took from his pocket and told me he was going to skin me for what I had done last night. But, said the doctor, before you are skinned, you had better confess your crime. What crime, master, shall I confess? I have committed no crime. What has been done that you are going to murder me, was my reply. My master then asked me why I had followed the young lady and her brother, who went from the house the evening before, and murdered her. Astonished and terrified at the charge of being a murderer, I knew not what to say, and only continued the protestations of my innocence and my entreaties not to be put to death. My young master was greatly enraged at me, and loaded me with maledictions and imprecations, and his father appeared to be as well satisfied as he was of my guilt, but was more calm and less vociferous in his language. The doctor during this time was assorting his instruments and looking at me. Then, stooping down and feeling my pulse, he said, It would not do to skin a man so full of blood as I was. I should bleed so much that he could not see to do his work and he should probably cut some large vein or artery by which I should bleed to death in a few minutes. It was necessary to bleed me in the arms for some time so as to reduce the quantity of blood that was in me before taking my skin off. He then bound a string round my right arm and opened a vein near the middle of the arm from which the blood ran in a large and smooth stream. I already began to feel faint with the loss of blood, when the cellar door was thrown open, and several persons came down with two lighted candles. I looked at these people attentively as they came near and stood around me, and expressed their satisfaction at the just and dreadful punishment that I was about to undergo. Their faces were all new and unknown to me, except that of a lad, whom I recognized as the same who had ridden by me the preceding evening in company with his sister. 
My old master spoke to this boy by name, and told him to come and see the murderer of his sister receive his due. The boy was a pretty youth, and wore his hair long, on the top of his head, in the fashion of that day. As he came round near my head, the light of a candle which the doctor held in his hand shone full in my face, and seeing that the eyes of the boy met mine, I determined to make one more effort to save my life, and said to him, in as calm a tone as I could, Young master, did I murder young mistress, your sister? The youth immediately looked at my master and said, This is not the man. This man had short wool, and he had long wool, like your hearty. My life was saved. I was snatched from the most horrible of tortures, and from a slow and painful death. I was unbound, the bleeding of my arms stopped, and I was suffered to put on my clothes and go up into the back yard of the house, where I was required to tell what I knew of the young lady and her brother on the previous day. I stated that I had seen them in the courtyard of the house at the time I was in the kitchen, that I had then gone to the woods to set my snares, and had seen them pass along the road near me, and that this was all the knowledge I had of them. The boy was then required to examine me particularly and ascertain whether I was or was not the man who had murdered his sister. He said he had not seen me at the place where I stated I was, and that he was confident I was not the person who had attacked him and his sister, that my hair, or wool as he called it, was short, but that of the man who committed the crime was long, like Hardy's, and that he was about the size of Hardy not so large as I was, but black like me, and not yellow like Hardy. Someone now asked where Hardy was, and he was called for, but could not be found in the kitchen. Persons were sent to the quarter and other places in quest of him, but returned without him. Hardy was nowhere to be found. Whilst this inquiry, or rather search, was going on, perceiving that my old master had ceased to look upon me as a murderer, I asked him to please tell me what had happened that had been so near proving fatal to me. I was now informed that the young lady who had left the house on the previous evening in company with her brother had been assailed on the road about four miles off by a black man who had sprung from a thicket and snatched her from her horse as she was riding a short distance behind her brother. That the assassin, as soon as she was on the ground, struck her horse a blow with a long stick which, together with the fright caused by the screams of its rider, when torn from it, had caused it to fly off at full speed, and the horse of the brother also taking fright, followed in pursuit, notwithstanding all the exertions of the lad to stop it. All the account the brother could give of the matter was that as his horse ran with him, he saw the negro drag his sister into the woods and heard her screams for a short time. He was not able to stop his horse until he reached home, when he gave information to his mother and her family that people had been scouring the woods all night and all the morning without being able to find the young lady. When intelligence of this horrid crime was brought to the house of my master, Hardy was the first to receive it, he having gone to take the horse of the person, a young gentleman of the neighborhood, who bore it, and who immediately returned to join his friends in their search for the dead body. As soon as the messenger was gone, Hardy had come to my master and told him that if he would prevent me from murdering him, he would disclose the perpetrator of the crime. He was then ordered to communicate all he knew on the subject, and declared that, having gone into the woods the day before to hunt squirrels, he stayed until it was late, and on his return home, hearing the shrieks of a woman, he had proceeded cautiously to the place. But before he could arrive at the spot, the cries had ceased. Nevertheless, he had found me, after some search, with the body of the young lady whom I had just killed, and that I was about to kill him, too, with a hickory club. But he had saved his life by promising that he would never betray me. He was glad to leave me, and what I had done with the body he did not know. Hardy was known in the neighborhood, and his character had been good. I was a stranger and on inquiry the black people in the kitchen supported Hardy by saying that I had been seen going to the woods before night by the way of the road which the deceased had traveled. These circumstances were deemed conclusive against me by my master, 
And as the offense of which I was believed to be guilty was the highest that can be committed by a slave, according to the opinion of owners, it was determined to punish me in a way unknown to the law, and to inflict tortures upon me which the law would not tolerate. I was now released, and though very weak from the effects of bleeding, I was yet able to return to my own lodgings. I had no doubt that Hardy was the perpetrator of the crime for which I was so near losing my life, and now recollected that when I was at the kitchen of the great house on Sunday, he had disappeared a short time before sundown, as I had looked for him when I was going to set my snares, but could not find him. I went back to the house and communicated this fact to my master. By this time, nearly twenty white men had collected about the dwelling with the intention of going to search for the body of the lost lady, but it was now resolved to make the lookout double and to give it the twofold character of a pursuit of the living, as well as a seeking for the dead. I now returned to my lodgings in the quarter, and soon fell into a profound sleep, from which I did not awake until long after night, when all was quiet, and the stillness of undisturbed tranquility prevailed over our little community. I felt restless, and sunk into a labyrinth of painful reflections, upon the horrid and perilous condition from which I had this day escaped, as it seemed, merely by chance. And as I slept until all sensations of drowsiness had left me, I rose from my bed and walked out by the light of the moon, which was now shining. After being in the open air some time, I thought of the snares I had set on Sunday evening and determined to go and see if they had taken any game. I sometimes caught possums in my snares and as these animals were very fat at this season of the year, I felt a hope that I might be fortunate enough to get one tonight. I had been at my snares and had returned as far as the road, near where I had seen the young lady and her brother on horseback on Sunday evening, and had seated myself under the boughs of a holly bush that grew there. It so happened that the place where I sat was in the shade of the bush within a few feet of the road, but screened from it by some small boughs. In this position, which I had taken by accident, I could see a great distance along the road towards the end of my master's lane, though covered as I was by the shade and enveloped in boughs, it was difficult for a person in the road to see me. The occurrence that had befallen me in the course of the previous day had rendered me nervous and easily susceptible of all the emotions of fear. I had not been long in this place when I thought I heard sounds, as of a person walking on the ground at a quick pace, and looking along the road towards the lane I saw the form of someone passing through a space in the road where the beams of the moon piercing between two trees reached the ground. When the moving body passed into the shade I could not see it, but in a short time it came so near that I could distinctly see that it was a man approaching me by the road. When he came opposite me, and the moon shone full in his face, I knew him to be a young mulatto named David, the coachman of a widow lady, who resided somewhere near Charleston, but who had been at the house of my master for two or three weeks as a visitor with her two daughters. This man passed on at a quick step without observing me, and the suspicion instantly riveted itself in my mind that he was the murderer for whose crime I had already suffered so much and that he was now on his way to the place where he had left the body for the purpose of removing or burying it in the earth. I was confident that no honest purpose could bring him to this place at this time of night alone. I was about two miles from home, and an equal distance from the spot where the girl had been seized. Of her subsequent murder no one entertained a doubt, for it was not to be expected that the fellow who had been guilty of one great crime would flinch from the commission of another of equal magnitude, and suffer his victim to exist as a witness to identify his person. I felt animated by a spirit of revenge against the wretch, whoever he might be, who had brought me so near to torture and death, and, feeble and weak as I was, resolved to pursue the footsteps of this coachman at a wary and cautious distance, and ascertain, if possible, the object of his visit to these woods at this time of night. I waited until he had passed me more than a hundred yards, and until I could barely discover his form in the faint light of the deep shade of the trees, when, stealing quietly into the road, 
I followed with the caution of a spy traversing the camp of an enemy. We were now in a dark pine forest, and on both sides of us were tracts of low, swampy ground covered with thickets so dense as to be difficult of penetration even by a person on foot. The road led along a neck of elevated and dry ground that divided these swamps for more than a mile when they terminated and were succeeded by ground that produced scarcely any other timber than a scrubby kind of oak called blackjack. It was amongst these blackjacks, about half a mile beyond the swamps, that the lady had been carried off. I had often been here for the purpose of snaring and trapping the small game of these woods, and was well acquainted with the topography of this forest for some distance on both sides of the road. It was necessary for me to use the utmost caution in the enterprise I was now engaged in. The road we were now traveling was in no place very broad, and at some points barely wide enough to permit a carriage to pass between the trees that lined its sides. In some places it was so dark that I could not see the man whose steps I followed, but was obliged to depend on the sound produced by the tread of his feet upon the ground. I deemed it necessary to keep as close as possible to the object of my pursuit, lest he should suddenly turn into the swamp on one side or the other of the road, and elude my vigilance, for I had no doubt that he would quit the road somewhere. As we approached the termination of the low grounds, my anxiety became intense lest he should escape me, and at one time I could not have been more than one hundred feet behind him, but he continued his course until he reached the oak woods and came to a place where an old cart road led off to the left along the side of the dark swamp as it was termed in the neighborhood. This road the mulatto took without turning to look behind him. Here my difficulties and perils increased, for I now felt myself in danger, as I had no longer any doubt that I was on the trail of the murderer, and that, if discovered by him, my life would be the price of my curiosity. I was too weak to be able to struggle with him for a minute though if the blood which I had lost through his wickedness could have been restored to my veins, I could have seized him by the neck and strangled him. The road I now had to travel was so little frequented that bushes of the ground oak and bilberry stood thick in almost every part of it. Many of these bushes were full of dry leaves, which had been touched by the frost but had not yet fallen. It was easy for me to follow him, for I pursued by the noise he made amongst these bushes. But it was not so easy for me to avoid on my part the making of a rustling and agitation of the bushes which might expose me to detection. I was now obliged to depend wholly on my ears to guide my pursuit, my eyes being occupied in watching my own way to enable me to avoid every object the touching of which was likely to produce sound. I followed this road more than a mile, led by the cracking of the sticks or the shaking of the leaves. At length I heard a loud, shrill whistle, and then a total silence succeeded. I now stood still, and in a few seconds heard a noise in the swamp like the drumming of a pheasant. Soon afterwards I heard the breaking of sticks and the sounds caused by the bending of branches of trees. In a little time I was satisfied that something having life was moving in the swamp, and coming towards the place where the mulatto stood. This was at the end of the cart road and opposite some large pine trees, which grew in the swamp at the distance of two or three hundred yards from its margin. The noise in the swamp still approached us, and at length a person came out of the thicket and stood for a minute or more with the mulatto whom I had followed, and then they both entered the swamp and took the course of the pine trees as I could easily distinguish by my ears. When they were gone, I advanced to the end of the road and sat down upon a log to listen to their progress through the swamp. At length it seemed that they had stopped, for I no longer heard anything of them. Anxious, however, to ascertain more of this mysterious business, I remained in silence on the log, determined to stay there until day if I could not sooner learn something to satisfy me why these men had gone into the swamp. All uncertainty upon this subject was, however, quickly removed from my mind, for within less than ten minutes, after I had ceased to hear them moving in the thicket, 
I was shocked by the faint but shrill wailings of a female voice, accompanied with exclamations and supplications in a tone so feeble that I could only distinguish a few solitary words. My mind comprehended the whole ground of this matter at a glance. The lady supposed to have been murdered on Sunday evening was still living, and concealed by the two fiends who had passed out of my sight but a few minutes before. The one I knew, for I had examined his features within a few feet of me in the full light of the moon, and that the other was hardy, I was as perfectly convinced as if I had seen him also. I now rose to return home, the cries of the female in the swamp still continuing but growing weaker and dying away as I receded from the place where I had sat. I was now in possession of the clearest evidence of the guilt of the two murderers, but I was afraid to communicate my knowledge to my master, lest he should suspect me of being an accomplice in this crime. And if the lady could not be recovered alive, I had no doubt that Hardy and his companion were sufficiently depraved to charge me as a participation with themselves to be avenged upon me. I was confident that the mulatto David would return to the house before day and be found in his bed in the morning, which he could easily do, for he slept in a part of the stable loft under pretense of being near the horses of his mistress. I thought it possible that Hardy might also return home that night and endeavor to account for his absence from home on Monday afternoon by some ingenious lie in the invention of which I knew him to be very expert. In this case, I saw that I should have to run the risk of being overpowered by the number of my false accusers, and as I stood alone, they might yet be able to sacrifice my life and escape the punishment due to their crimes. After much consideration, I came to the resolution of returning, as quick as possible, to the quarter, calling up the overseer and acquainting him with all that I had seen, heard, and done in the course of this night. As I did not know what time of night it was when I left my bed, I was apprehensive that day might break before I could so far mature my plans as to have persons to waylay and arrest the mulatto on his return home. But when I roused the overseer, he told me it was only one o'clock, and seemed but little inclined to credit my story. But after talking to me several minutes, he told me he, now more than ever, suspected me to be the murderer but he would go with me and see if I had told the truth. When we arrived at the great house, some members of the family had not yet gone to bed, having been kept up by the arrival of several gentlemen who had been searching the woods all day for the lost lady and who had come here to seek lodgings when it was near midnight. My master was in bed, but was called up and listened attentively to my story, at the close of which he shook his head and said with an oath, You blank! I believe you to be the murderer, but we will go and see if all you say is a lie. If it is, the torments of blank will be pleasure to what awaits you. You have escaped once, but you will not get off a second time. I now found that somebody must die, and if the guilty could not be found, the innocent would have to atone for them. The manner in which my master had delivered his words assured me that the life of somebody must be taken. This new danger aroused my energies, and I told them that I was ready to go and take the consequences. Accordingly, the overseer, my young master, and three other gentlemen immediately set out with me. It was agreed that we should all travel on foot, the overseer and I going a few paces in advance of the others. We proceeded silently but rapidly on our way, and as we passed it, I showed them the place where I sat under the holly bush when the mulatto passed me. We neither saw nor heard any person on the road, and reached the log at the end of the cart road, where I sat when I heard the cries in the swamp. All was now quiet, and our party lay down in the bushes on each side of a large gum tree, at the root of which the two murderers stood when they talked together, before they entered the thicket. We had not been here more than an hour, when I heard, as I lay with my head near the ground, a noise in the swamp, which I believe could only be made by those whom we sought. I, however, said nothing, and the gentleman did not hear it. It was caused, as I afterwards ascertained, by dragging the fallen branch of a tree along the ground for the purpose of lighting the fire. 
The night was very clear and serene, its silence only being broken at intervals by the loud hooting of the great long-eared owls, which are numerous in these swamps. I felt oppressed by the cold, and was glad to hear the crowing of a cock at a great distance announcing the approach of day. This was followed after a short interval by the cracking of sticks, and by other tokens which I knew could proceed only from the motions of living bodies. I now whispered to the overseer who lay near me that it would soon appear whether I had spoken the truth or not. All were now satisfied that people were coming out of the swamp, for we heard them speak to each other. I desired the overseer to advise the other gentlemen to let the culprits come out of the swamp and gain the high ground before we attempted to seize them. But this counsel was unfortunately not taken, and when they came near to the gum tree, and it could be clearly seen that there were two men and no more, one of the gentlemen called out to them to stop, or they were dead. Instead, however, of stopping, they both sprang forward and took to flight. They did not turn into the swamp, for the gentleman who ordered them to stop was in their rear, they having already passed him. At the moment they had started to run, each of the gentlemen fired two pistols at them. The pistols made the forest ring on all sides, and I supposed it was impossible for either of the fugitives to escape from so many balls. This was, however, not the case, for only one of them was injured. The mulatto David had one arm and one leg broken and fell about ten yards from us, but Hardy escaped, and when the smoke cleared away, he was nowhere to be seen. On being interrogated, David acknowledged that the lady was in the swamp on a small island, and was yet alive, that he and Hardy had gone from the house on the Sunday for the purpose of waylaying and carrying her off, and intended to kill her little brother, this part of the duty being assigned to him, whilst Hardy was to drag the sister from her horse. As they were both mulattoes, they blackened their faces with charcoal taken from a pine stump partially burned. The boy was riding before his sister, and when Hardy seized her and dragged her from her horse, she screamed and frightened both the horses, which took off at full speed, by which means the boy escaped. Finding that the boy was out of his reach, David remained in the bushes until Hardy brought the sister to him. They immediately tied a handkerchief round her face, so as to cover her mouth and stifle her shrieks, and taking her in their arms, carried her back toward my master's house, for some distance through the woods, until they came to the cart road leading along the swamp. They then followed this road as far as it led, and, turning into the swamp, took their victim to a place they had prepared for her the Sunday before, on a small knoll in the swamp, where the ground was dry. Her hands were closely confined, and she was tied by the feet to a tree. He said he had stolen some bread and taken it to her that night, but when they unbound her mouth to permit her to eat, she only wept and made a noise, begging them to release her, until they were obliged again to bandage her mouth. End of chapter 9, part 1. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista.